Good morning, uh, and welcome uh, to the January 18th meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Could we start with a roll call? Commissioner Bertrand? Here. Commissioner Brown? Here. Commissioner Johnson? Commissioner Rios? Commissioner Caput? Here. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin? Here. Commissioner Friend? Here. Commissioner Leopold? Here. Commissioner McPherson? Here. Commissioner Chase? Commissioner Bator. Here. All right. Well, um, and Commissioner Lowe. I'm sorry. Here. Okay. Don't forget her. She's your right hand. Um, uh, at our last meeting, uh, there was complaints that we didn't get to the meat of the meeting until later on, and so um, I'm going to move oral communications to the end of the meeting, uh, so we can get to the items that are on our regular agenda uh, as quickly as possible. So, uh, I'll look to see if there's any additions or deletions to the agenda. Good morning, Mr. Dondero. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Um, yes, we have um, a replacement page for page two of the agenda. We have a handout for item 17, a handout, um, public comments on item 20, and we have a handout of uh, slides for the um, presentation that will be part of item 20. Okay, thank you. Then we'll move on to the consent agenda. Um, these are items that are considered non-controversial and will be taken as one motion. Uh, is there anyone who would like to uh, pull an item off the consent agenda? Yes, please. Um, my name is Gail McNulty. I'm with Executive, I'm Executive Director with Greenway. Um, and actually, I've got a lot of things I just wanted to speak to on the consent agenda. Um, First of all, under budget and expenditure items, number 10 for approving storm damage repairs, the civil engineering services. Um, I realize that that may go hand in hand with Supervisor, Fre um, Supervisor Friend's letter that he wrote about the um, needed maintenance that homeowners are requesting and that this is perhaps addressing that, this thing that came out here today. But I believe that both um, item number 10 under budget and item number 13B relate to item 20 on the regular agenda, so I would request that you would pull those off. I think it's important that when we talk about going forward with a fair unified corridor study process, we really look carefully about how we're spending our money. We are still trying to figure out how to pull potholes. If you're asking to pull it, we will wait till, till, to... Okay. Uh, I'm just justifying that I think it. it relates to item 20. It should be included in that discussion. Item number 13C, um, I just would like to make sure that everybody has had a chance to take a look at that. The elderly and disabled are complaint. Um, I think looking for help on metro fares, and that's something that I think is also part of our overall discussion that when things are put through on the consent agenda, it, you may not have a chance to really think too much about them, and it's important because it relates very much to how we spend our money. Um, and then going down to item number 15, accept information items. I'm really confused as to why this is always all um, news stories about rail, and we don't ever seem to have the op-eds or anything for anything other than rail. So just again, what you're projecting as a regional transportation commission that is currently doing a unified corridor study that is looking at different options. If you're going to accept any of these information items, you really should be representing all of the communication that's going on in our community. It's very subjective to be choosing just these. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we will move item 10 and 13B uh, to the, uh, uh, we'll make them items number uh, 20A and 20B. Is there anyone else about items on the consent agenda? Uh, seeing none, I will uh, ask for... The consent agenda is amended. Motion by Schifrin. Second. Seconded by Chase. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any uh, uh, objections or abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Then we will move on to the regular agenda. Uh, here we will start with commissioner reports. Are there any commissioners who would like to report? Seeing none, we will move I on to item. Have a report. Oh, uh, good morning, Mr. Bertrand. So um, last Thursday at the Capitola City Council meeting, we had a presentation um, by Fort and Greenway, and um, 
as you could imagine, it was uh, quite filled. Our auditorium, excuse me, our city council chambers was completely full, and we had an overall uh, room, overflow room. So, um, by and large, the discussion centered around waiting for the completion of the unified corridor study, which is what the city of Capitola chose to do at that point. One person was not there and also making a statement, which we chose not to do. So we feel in Capitola that the unified quarter study is eminently important in terms of making decisions for Santa Cruz and providing transportation needs. So I'd like to emphasize that from Capitola's standpoint. Okay, thank you. Any other commissioners? Seeing none, I'll move on to item number 17, which is a director report. Good morning, Mr. Dondero. Good morning, commissioners. Um, just a few items this morning um, to report on. First, um, our rail corridor maintenance program, uh, which um, is uh, addressed by in a letter from uh, Commissioner Friend that's in the consent agenda, agenda previously mentioned. Um, in response to that, uh, I'd like you to know that RTC staff has been working very diligently to repair and resolve the storm damage on the line. Uh, to establish a preventative maintenance program and to respond to ongoing issues along the rail line. Uh, staff is putting the tools and protocols in place to manage the corridor through three major areas, storm damage repair, maintaining the right-of-way, and creation of a web-based issue reporting system. Um, a request for qualifications for on-call civil uh, engineering services will soon be issued, and it is broken up into three categories. Uh, civil engineering, structural engineering inspections, and uh, construction management. Uh, and details on the entire program will be provided to you at our March RTC meeting. Uh, secondly, our Visualizing Sustainable Transportation project is entering phase two. Uh, staff has partnered with the city of Watsonville uh, to support their downtown complete streets planning efforts. Um, An RFP was released last month, and we expect to be underway on the project by early March. In this phase, we will produce visualizations that will be used during the outreach phase of the planning process for the city's complete streets plan. Uh, and finally, um, the Central Coast Coalition Ledge Day is an annual event. Um, is January 30th. Uh, I will join Chair Leopold and representatives from the other four Central Coast Coalition counties for a day in Sacramento to visit our delegation and transportation officials from the CCC. That concludes my report. Thank you for the brief report. Questions, uh, Mr. Bertrand? Uh, yeah. Um, one of the things that I pressed for earlier was uh, updates on the Unified Quarter Study. And um, being that Capitola feels this is a particularly important item to be addressed, um, I'd like more attention to that. And I was going to ask the chair if we could have a side committee, have some discussion about a side committee to keep uh, individual members of the RTC abreast of all activities that are going on with the Unified Quarter Study. So it's my request to the chair. The other thing is um, some months ago, uh, at the beginning of the year, spring, I think, uh, we asked for a study to be done on the Capitola Trestle. Came up in our discussion last Thursday. We're very concerned about the uh, future of the trestle, its uh, capability of um, sustaining uh, traffic. Um, that was due in November, and I haven't seen it yet. So I was wondering about the status of that report. Okay. Is my mic on? Or? Okay. Um, you're, you're correct, uh, Commissioner Bertrand. Uh, the, um, uh, you did request uh, an engineering an analysis or inspection of the uh, bridge in Capitola. The RTC is working to, to release a request for proposals for uh, engineering services, as was mentioned by, by the director, that will include inspections of uh, uh, railroad uh, bridges, uh, including the Capitola Bridge. Uh, I know one of the concerns from the city of Capitola was that uh, not, there should be this inspection or analysis before any trains ran over the line again, and since the, there are no trains running over the line, um, we felt that it was okay to take a little more time uh, to make sure that uh, we got an engineer uh, on board at the, at the RTC, whom we have now, uh, and to make sure that that analysis is done 
with uh, you know much better oversight from the RTC. So it was brought to my attention when I brought it up earlier in the year, uh, last year, excuse me, that November represented the timeline at which a report should be due. I think it was two years. And also we got some communication to the City of Capitola that the report that was done did not look adequately at the foundation in terms of its actual ability to support sustained transportation and all that that would uh, you know joggle the foundation liquefaction since it's a creek so etc stuff like that so we're very concerned the reason why we're concerned actually is because people live people actually live below that trestle so it's not an academic issue it's a real issue for many people uh, supervisor french uh, chair just a just for a point of order in the um, the executive director answered some of the questions associated with item 13b but that's a pulled item would you like me to wait to address my questions back to him to when that item is heard as uh, item yeah one? that would okay. be great are there any other questions for the executive director seeing none we'll move on to uh, item 18 which is our caltrans report good morning ms Lowe. good morning mr chair members of the commission and happy new year in many ways, we're being, uh, being uh, I guess the new year is kind of hitting us hard in some ways uh, with in particular regard to storm damage. Storm damage is something that this county is very familiar with after the storms of last year. Um, and this year, uh, as you might know, on January 9th, there was an unprecedented uh, storm event uh, following the, the Thomas fire in Southern California that brought down um, a huge amount of debris mud onto Highway 101 in Santa Barbara, in the city of Santa Barbara, and the count in the northern part of the county. Highway 101 is still closed. Certainly, if you are, if Santa Barbara is your destination, you can get there. You cannot get south of 101 on the freeway at this time. We haven't announced a new opening yet, but we have been partnering with Amtrak, uh, and there are, you know, if you're a commuter down there, there have also been uh, shuttles uh, marine shuttles have, have been operating between Ventura and Santa Barbara. Uh, they normally are the ones that take people out to the islands to go diving. But uh, there's been a number of, of, of efforts uh, to come into play there to, um, to allow people to continue to connect to Southern California. But if Southern California is your destination, we'd still advise people to use an inland route, uh, go down Interstate 5. Uh, we do have people working around the clock and um, just want everybody to know uh, that that's uh, taking up a significant amount of resource, but we are um, committed to getting that open as soon as possible. Meanwhile, other business that we continue on with is we've announced our call for projects for transportation planning grants. <coughs> the 2018-19 cycle is now upon us. You might know we just announced awards uh, last fall from an extra amount that was available to us through Senate Bill 1. This round, there are uh, $40.8 million available for transportation planning grants in the, in the categories of sustainable communities, strategic partnerships, and adaptation planning. And in each of these, we're encouraging local and regional agencies to look forward to uh, new endeavors to uh, make transportation a m better community amenity and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, as well as um, become ready for the changes that we face as our um, as the climate changes around us. You also have an updated project update in your packet. And there are a couple other items I just want to highlight uh, that are in your packet. One was the um, <coughs> Uh, the letter responding to questions uh, late in the year. You had a number of questions regarding uh, 152, um, pedestrian access on, in the Watsonville area, as well as the uh, wildlife connectivity program and how the credit system will work. So hopefully we've answered those questions in, in the letter to you. If you have uh, need for more information, I can provide that to you. Finally, uh, I wanted to bring some information about the California Road Charge Pilot Program. This document, this is a highlight document that's also in your packet. It's also available on the website, California Road Charge Pilot. 
Senate Bill 1077 called for information to be developed about a potential replacement for the gas tax. This would be a long-term sustainable transportation funding mechanism. And I just want to emphasize research. This is a research effort. Uh, the, it was the largest research effort of its kind. There were 5,000 vehicles <coughs> that participated, so drivers uh, with representing 5,000 vehicles, and over 37 million miles were reported over the nine-month period. <coughs> the graphic on the screen there uh, identifies the four phases that were undertaken. There was a one-year phase just to develop the design of the program. Then there was a second phase to uh, set up the program with the um, with getting the volunteers, getting the equipment ready. Um, the third phase was operating it. And that was uh, occurred over a nine-month period. Are there folks here who may have anybody here? Just me. All right. Okay. Did I hear one more? Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, and then fi phase four is the report. The phase four report is available now. As you see, this is a, um, a four-page highlight. There's a summary report, and then there is also a full report available. This effort was sponsored by the California State Transportation Agency, and it was managed by Caltrans in coordination with the California Transportation Commission. They tested, uh, basically they tested three things, the functionality the complexity and the feasibility of a road user charge. And the very basis of a road user charge is to, is to have, have people, have users pay according to the miles they drive. And as you know, the current method of, of revenue for transportation is gas tax predominantly. <coughs> uh, in Santa Cruz County, you're now afforded the luxury of a sales tax initiative tied to another mechanism. The reason that we need to look at other options is because of the, the dynamics with fuel efficiency uh, and inflation and our desire to wean ourselves off of fossil fuel vehicles. A gas tax, as we've had increased with SB1, was a very critical step in the overall scheme of transportation, being able to have a sustainable source of revenue to fix what's broken, but looking beyond our kind of current horizon, we need to look at something that's longer and even more sustainable. This uh, research validated the feasibility of our user-based mechanism, but it has not by any means uh, made any conclusion or recommendation to adopt a user-based recommendation, a user-based fee to implement it. Additional investigation is needed and of course there would be legislation and, and a, com a complexity of other issues that would have to come to pass before a, um, such a charge would be in place. Uh, but there, uh, more investigation and, um, and these mechanics could ensue in time. Uh, this report just gives you the overview of what we learned with this research. Uh, the graphics um, on the screen here indicate uh, a breakdown of, of who the volunteers were, uh, what they, um, how, how they were distributed around the state, the types of vehicles um, that, that participate in the program, and the uh, types of, of recording mechanisms that were available. So what happens next is, um, is really up to the, the legislature uh, in terms of what direction we want to pursue. But this provides uh, the information necessary to take, to, to take it into a, another um, avenue, venue. Any questions? Other questions for Ms. Lowe? Uh, Mr. Schifrin. I have a question about the uh, <coughs> Highway 17 Wildlife Connectivity Project. Um, at the letter says that uh, at this point, construction funding has not been identified as part of this agreement. Which agreement are you talking about? Because I thought Measure D did include funding for that project. I know they don't have all the funding, as I understand it, isn't available, but some of it is. Uh, yes, Commissioner Schiffer, this, this is specific to 
the agreement with Cal Fish and Wildlife Service, Cal, Cal Fish and Wildlife, the agreement, the credit agreement was established specific to the $3 million investment from the State Highway Operations Protection Program. And that investment was just funding the uh, support for the development of the project to, to basically deliver a set of plans. So then, so construction funding itself is not part of the agreement itself. The agreement between Caltrans and CDF. Or Correct. CD, CDFW. I call them Cal Wild, yes. Cal Wild. <laughs> and then you recommend that the commission may wish to consider engaging in similar negotiations with Cal Wild for local contributions to earn credits. What does that mean? I mean, are you suggesting that co the commission contact the Cal Wild directly and to try to negotiate an agreement where uh, the local contributions would mean money from the uh, say Measure D would be considered uh, part of that. I'm just trying to understand what how this all is, could fit together. Yes, Commissioner uh, Sherman, generally speaking, yes. The, the contributions that came from the shop were subject of this negotiation that resulted in this agreement. The, the commission's contribution to the construction would be subject to a subsequent agreement. The ex we'd probably work with you on that or, or get you going because the, the framework is there. Uh, but it was just for that amount to to establish that moving forward. And uh, subsequent, there hasn't been, we just haven't had the discussions about the construction funding yet. So I wonder, mm -hmm. I, I, there's a question for, for our director. Is, does the commission need, does the commission need to give you a staff a direction to follow up on this to work with Caltrans and Cal Wild on the local contribution, or is that sort of incorporated in what you're intending to do anyway? It's my understanding we would do that automatically. Um, we certainly want to get the credits the same as Caltrans got them, because we could use those on future future product projects. So we haven't programmed that money yet. The project's still in the very early stages, which is why we haven't gotten there yet. But we will definitely. That will be included. That in will the be work included. Group. Yes, as okay, part of our agreement you. with with Caltrans. But we appreciate the question coming up, so there's not an assumption that it would go to come to pass. So, uh, <clears throat> it's just another way in which the Measure D funds help us with uh, with other projects down the line. So it's that investment really makes a difference. So I'm glad to hear this uh, information, and I think we can uh, take advantage of it. Are there other questions for Ms. Lowe, uh, Mr. Rios? Yes. Good morning. I uh, wanted to follow up just on 152. There are um, areas like um, Brewington and East Lake, uh, 152, where two schools are there, and we wanted to follow up on seeing how we can put uh, lights, uh, safety lights. So my understanding is that we have to go through you to make that happen. Yes, we own the the highway, so there's a there's a relationship there where uh, a request would be made. Uh, we've we've done a lot of evaluation of the mm -hmm. 152 area, and we could probably provide you another assessment of another update on our assessments. Okay, I would like to follow up on that because there, we have two schools. The traffic is pretty uh, pretty pretty intense there, and that's been coming a lot of complaints from the residents. So our staff will be following up with you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other questions. ask five minutes of questions uh, because we do have a 930 item or we could just take a, a, a short break uh, supervisor Caput I'll, I'll give this to you after uh, you know the meeting but uh, at on 152 also uh, a woman with her bicycle was uh, killed at uh, Auto Center Drive and 152 and um, friends and relatives are requesting that there is no speed limit sign after the, it's 40 miles an hour at Clifford and Maloney on 152. And after that, there's no sign until you get to Main Street and Freedom Boulevard, where it then reduces to 25. So uh, they're requesting that uh, a speed limit sign be put in that would actually be uh, less than 40 miles an hour uh, between. Uh, Clifford, Ohlone, and also uh, Rodriguez. Um, uh, Commissioner Caput, we uh, we addressed that question in our letter as well. There are, as you noted, there are two speed limits, 40 at one point and 25 at the other. 
uh, there's not an opportunity for us to, to impose um, a step down speed limit, but I know that you've asked for advan you know, warning signs that let people know that there's a speed reduction ahead and we're looking into that. And so, so it would be something other than the uh, lowering the speed that would be some kind of a warning light or what would it be? Our, our engineers are looking into what that would be, but it would not be an intermediate speed limit. That would not be enforceable. And it's a little confusing at uh, Freedom Boulevard in Maine that if you're going south, uh, southeast, uh, then it's uh, 25 going into town, but uh, right across the street on going out of town, it's uh, 40 miles. That little contradictory there. Yeah. I don't believe so, but I mean, there you got the zone is going in. You got mm -hmm. 40 across the street going out. Yeah, the, the zones are, um, we do surveys for speed zones every seven years and um, take that responsibly very seriously. So certainly that area outside of town is a higher speed limit than it is in the downtown area. So that would explain why you would have a, a different sign leaving town. And then later on I'll give you the, the write-up on a request to maybe in the future looking at where Ansoldo School is. Uh, there, there's a lot of traffic, there's a park there, there's a school there, and uh, when you're crossing uh, uh, 152 at that point, it's very, it's getting to be <coughs> very dangerous. Uh, we're going to put sidewalks on both sides, uh, so some kind of a warning light there too or something uh, so people can get in and out of the park and the school without crossing the freeway uh, during high traffic. And this is information that you have for me. You said you'd give me after the meeting for it to be more specific. Thank you. Ms. Lowe, I just had one question about the road charge project. Yes. Um, if the uh, state decided to go with uh, some method uh, that was uh, used here, would that require a two-thirds vote of the legislature or the, um, the voters because it's a new uh, fee or charge? Mr. McPherson? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. There would have to be, it, it would have to be enacted via, through the legislature and, um, <laughs> well, that's usually so easy, so. Yep, uh, right, yes, wanna... yes, yes. Um, okay, well, uh, we're going to take a, uh, uh, a one or two minute break and uh, ask that uh, the. Well, I uh, wonder uh, whether we need to hear from the public. Okay. There's an item on your. All right, we'll see if there's members of the public who would like to address us about the Caltrans report. Thank you very much. My name is Becky Steinbruner. I'm a resident of Aptos. I have a question about the road charge. How would that be assessed per vehicle, per driver, um, for older vehicles that may not have the built-in Bluetooth automatic tracking devices that newer cars have? And my second question is, I've, I've spoken to you before about many neighborhood concerns in the Sea Cliff area of Aptos at the intersection of um, State Park and Highway 1 southbound <coughs> and uh, off-ramp and northbound uh, and, uh, and southbound on-ramp. Um, it has been made public that by Supervisor Friend that is Caltrans' responsibility for that intersection danger nearby at Sea Ridge and State Park. It is a huge concern of safety for those areas. And I would really appreciate Caltrans looking into it for improvements. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address us about the Caltrans report? Uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Brett Garrett, and I just wanted to say something quick about the planning grants that are being offered uh, by Caltrans. Um, this is a tremendous opportunity to expand the uh, Unified Corridor Study to include personal rapid transit. Um, I believe we can have the best transportation system and the best trail and the lowest carbon emissions all at the same time by implementing personal rapid transit on the rail corridor. Um, this planning grant is a huge opportunity to apply to get funds to, to, to get that studied, and I encourage it. Thank you. Thank you. Morning. Good morning. My name is William Minshin, a uh, longtime resident in the Santa Cruz, and I would like to address that same uh, that same planning grant and suggest that the 
RTC consider seriously about looking at toll, um, toll road usage of Highway 1 as a way of actually uh, eventually developing into something that would provide for um, bus rapid transit and high occupancy uh, toll lanes on the freeway. Thank you. Thank you. We're looking at new things. Um, it wouldn't hurt to study the small autonomous minibuses that are being tested all around us in Northern California. They expected to have them on the road by the end of 2017 in San Francisco. I think that's been extended, but they're testing them in San Jose, San Rafael. Software was invented just over the hill. It's a local technology. Um, and it's something that would fit very nicely with the scale of Santa Cruz. So, and it would be affordable, no gas. No operating costs, eco-friendly. I don't understand why it's not part of the Unified Corridor Study. Thank you. We're trying to talk about the Caltrans uh, report here. Good morning. Uh, one thing that uh, struck to me in that report was the whole sh um, SoCal mention of uh, the Highway 101 being shut down in an area. And I noticed that there was actually some redundancy uh, that they had going on there. They mentioned that Amtrak was able to save the day and offer a commuters a solution there. And the point with that is redundancy is sexy. And we need to look at that as an option for uh, ensuring our our region has options in times of transportation crisis or any sort of crisis. And so as Caltrans works on the 2040 or 2040 plan, state rail plan, I think that might be able to tie in as well and uh, provide us some extra options for getting people moving around here. Thank you. Thank you. Or anyone else? Seeing none, we will go to our item 19, which is a scheduled 930 public hearing on the draft 2040 regional transportation plan. There's a staff report, the executive summary of the draft 2040 regional transportation plan. Um, morning, Ms. Blakesey. <coughs> about that. Good morning, Ms. Dicar. Uh, item today is the public hearing on the draft 2040. Can you speak up, please? Okay. Let me start again here. Good morning, commissioners. My item on the agenda is the public hearing for the draft 2040 Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Plan, otherwise known as the RTP. The Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Plan is a state-mandated long-range transportation plan. The RTC is responsible for developing and implementing for Santa Cruz County. This plan is a minor update to the work that was done for the 2014 Regional Transportation Plan. There are three main components of the plan. The first is the policy element. It, this includes the goals, policies, and targets. This was based on the work that was done for the 2014 RTP to rework the policy element based on a triple bottom line analysis. The draft goals, policies, and targets were approved by this commission in March 2016 with a slight revision um, in the policies and targets that were approved in April 2017. <coughs> Another component of the plan is the financial element. This is an estimate of how much transportation revenue will be available for Santa Cruz County over the next 22 year time period. The total estimate is 3.7 billion over this time period. Uh, there's 52% um, estimated to be from local. There's 36 estimated to be from the state and federal is 12%. The uh, third element is the action element. This defines the transportation needs in our county that are required to operate, maintain, and improve the transportation system. RTC staff works very closely with the local jurisdictions and other project sponsors to develop this list. This first, the list was divided to, was um, brought together to define all the transportation needs in the county. And then this list was divided into the projects that could be funded within the foreseeable revenues, this 3.7 million that was developed in the financial element, as well as uh, projects that would need additional funding in order to be implemented. 
The complete project list was approved by the commission in August 2016. And then the constrained project list or the priority project list based on the financial um, constraints was approved in April 2017. And this project list is um, over 500 projects. It can be found in Appendix F of the draft document. These projects include roadway projects, transit, um, bicycle and pedestrian projects, as well as um, programs. This project list, um, the total need for the county was, is estimated at seven billion, and the available amount of revenue is 3.7 billion. So it's about half of the need is um, accommodated for under our financial constraints. The RTC is also coordinating with AMBAG on the Metropolitan Transportation Plan. AMBAG, the Association for Monterey Bay Area Governments, develops the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, which incorporates the regional transportation plans from Santa Cruz, San Benito, and Monterey. <laughs> the information that Santa Cruz County develops for both the financial element and the action element, which is the project list, feeds into the Metropolitan Transportation Plan um, that AMBAG is developing. The Regional Transportation Plan is subject to the California Environmental Quality Act requirements, otherwise known as CEQA. This environmental impact report for the, for the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Plan, as well as the Regional Transportation Plans for Monterey and San Benito are all combined together into a combined environmental impact report for the whole uh, region. AMBAG is the lead on this effort, um, but RTC staff has been coordinating very closely with AMBAG. The next steps for this project are the um, on January 30th, AMBAG is the lead in providing uh, open house and public hearing for the environmental impact report that'll be held at Simpkins um, between six and eight o'clock. On February 5th is <clears throat> the end of the public comment period for the 2040 Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Plan, the draft EIR, as well as the 2040 Metropolitan Transportation Plan. On March 1st, uh, RTC staff is scheduled to bring back to the commission the final draft regional transportation plan based on the comments that are being received prior to the February 5th deadline um, in order to uh, submit the project <coughs> list to AMBAG for their final run of their travel demand model to bring all this information together. And then on June 13th, AMBAG will be uh, scheduled to adopt their final 2040 Metropolitan Transportation Plan Sustainable Community Strategy and to certify, uh, consider and certify the final environmental impact report. And then RTC staff will be coming back to this commission on June 21st to adopt the final 2040 Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Plan and to receive the final environmental impact report. With that, I'll be happy to take any comments and questions. Thank you. Are there any questions or uh, comments, uh, Mr. Bertrand? You have a, con a question. Um, can you refer to page 3-13? And while she's looking that up, this is, um, I'll repeat the line. Uh, the report recommends upgrading the rail on the Santa Cruz branch line to Federal Rail Administration Class 2 rails so that we can have speeds up to 25 miles an hour. So I just a uh, general question. How would you characterize the current state of the rail that we have in our corridor? Are we class one? Are we going up to class two in certain areas? Or are we even below class one? Um, I can try to address that. Uh, the operator that's uh, been out there, uh, they've been operating the line at uh, accepted track, which is uh, the minimum level uh, that you must have to operate uh, lowest level of freight service. Uh, and wherever they've uh, run passenger excursion service, they've done the work necessary to make sure that the track was at, at class one. Uh, now, as you know, the, the rail line did suffer some damages as a report as a result of the storm. So obviously in you know, some spots, uh, th there's some work needed uh, to make sure that the track uh, is usable. But uh, uh, that's uh, primarily um, north of uh, Watsonville and up to uh, about just, just past the um, dump area. So. Um, Follow-up question. Yep. Um, since um, we do have commercial operations around Watsonville, how would you characterize the rail quality around Watsonville in terms of I class? I ask a point of procedure here. The purpose of this item is to provide input to staff on the regional transportation plan. It's not to discuss the rail project or rail facilities. It's about 
do we want changes in the plan? Do we have particular comments on the plan itself? And that's, as I understand it, maybe staff can correct me, is the purpose of this item. Okay, I stand corrected. Um, I do have another question about page 4-3. This is the sustainability policies. So I note that on most items, the economic benefit or the cost effectiveness is being checked off. So would you characterize this as a major component to try to figure out if anything is sustainable for any kind of improvements here in Santa Cruz? I'm sorry, are you looking at the cost effectiveness and system? Yeah, um, when I look at all the, well? the, the rows, uh, consistently either cost um, issues are checked off. So it sounds to me like that's a major component for anything that we choose to move forward on. I just want to know. Effectiveness. Yeah. So that is part of the um, policies and goals of our plan. It is part of it, but it seems to be a, a major function, a major portion. That's what I just want to confirm. Okay, thanks. One other question. So on page 7-2, um, 7-2, I'm trying to understand figure 7-1, 7.1. So it seems like the, the long-term trend for the daily total VMT is dropping. 15% reduction is uh, according to this graph since um, 2005. Um, do you feel that this is a fairly good projection? The recent year shows a rise. So I'm trying to understand that. Yeah, this data is um, taken from the Highway Performance Monitoring System that Caltrans runs. So the information is um, developed by taking traffic counts from the various different roadways in our county and then estimate the vehicle miles traveled related to that um, based on the traffic counts. There's, they can't take traffic counts everywhere, as you can imagine. So I think it is a good estimate. As you can see, there is an anomalous number here for 2010, which um, I think that the methodology that they were going through at the time in developing the system had changed. Um, so there's a little bit of a blip there. Uh, I think that we um, this provides some good information for our county as far as what what the vehicle miles traveled is looking like, both as a total and then um, per capita. There's the per capita numbers here are representative of the actual um, population estimates from the Department of Finance through 2015, but that's also a piece of the 2020 trend line is. Um, what the VMT per capita would be. So this this data is challenging to get. I feel like it is um, some of the best data that we can have for trying to under as trying to understand greenhouse gas emissions and uh, vehicle miles travel changes in our county. No, I appreciate that. It seems like going back to 2011 to get our time frame would be more accurate than going back to 2005 in terms of the trend. The reason 2005 is used is because that's what required for Senate Bill 375. And so um, initially the, um, the baseline for some of the legislation, executive orders from um, in the past have, was 1990, but that became unrealistic because the data was not available for 1990. So then the, the baseline that was decided for through Senate Bill 375 was 2005. So that's why we're trying to keep some consistency with the way people are viewing these different numbers. There's a, there's a lot of um, differences in the way things are viewed, vehicle miles traveled are viewed, greenhouse gas emission reductions are viewed, and as much as we can keep to a standard, the, more, the easier it'll be for an understanding of what's happening. Okay, I appreciate that clarification. There are other questions, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I think the most telling thing is we have $7 billion worth of needs over the next 22 years and we're, we, we're going to get half the revenue. Is, um, you think if this change the vehicle miles travel, would that 3.7 7 change that much? I mean, if we based some of our funding mechanisms according to that, is it going to be stable whether we have just pure sales tax, what we're doing now compared to get into the vehicle miles traveled, or is there a nexus there? Rachel Morricone of our staff is really the expert in the financial estimate for this document. Um, given Senate Bill 1 and the changes with the um, amount of money that's available for transportation, I think things are looking a little bit better. Um, but um, 
Commissioner Lowe brought up the issues with developing um, transportation funding based on a gas tax is uh, not a sustainable system and moving towards something where it's based on vehicle miles traveled in the long run, it seems like is the direction that we need to go. Does that answer your question? Yep. Other uh, questions? Thank you uh, for the presentation. And now I will open up the public hearing for any comments about the 2040 Regional Transportation Plan. Um, let's just do, let's do it at three minutes. Uh, I'm not sure how many speakers we have. How many people would like to speak to this item? Uh, just a handful. Uh, if you could keep your comments brief, that would be great. Morning. Hi. Um, so I haven't had a chance to um, review this uh, this uh, current draft, uh, but I, I was informed that it's uh, something we, we revise every year. And um, I'm here to speak about uh, a, a particular interest I have in um, uh, the 17 Express, amp, uh, the Highway uh, 17 Express Amtrak uh, connector shuttle uh, service. Uh, that's uh, let's see, uh, per uh, it pertains a lot to. I mean, I guess uh, uh, Cynthia, Cynthia Ed, and then um, I don't believe the other um, uh, transit uh, representatives here uh, at the meeting. But um, <coughs> uh, one thing that I observed when I was uh, um, riding um, across, I I I, I timed myself. Uh, Leaving uh, on the bus there uh, uh, from Scotts Valley to uh, Campbell, and it was exactly 30 minutes. So that's half as long as it takes for that bus to go uh, on a normal trip. Now um, that bus serves uh, a lot of different interests. Uh, it serves uh, well, namely it serves Amtrak connection, connections, and then VTA and uh, SCMTD. Uh, but it also uh, it also serves um, you know like a, a huge Number of different uh, uh, demographics. I, I want. I made a list. Uh, so it serves uh, San Jose State University. Um, you know, just any member of this, the um, uh, Santa Clara Chamber of Commerce, the Silicon Valley organization. Uh, UCSC vacationing students use it, and it's really impacted when they use it um, on those days, those three-day weekends. Uh, Caltrain connectors, anybody going to just light rail anywhere over the entire valley. Well, um, one thing that I noticed was that it was established around 1990. And uh, at that time, uh, the only way to get across to um, San Jose was uh, the Greyhound. And the Greyhound would stop in um, Los Gatos. And at that time, you know, it was, you know, uh, pretty, you know, it was pretty hard to come up with 650. So getting to Los Gatos was kind of nice for 525. But um, basically, uh, the valley has developed since we, we established that route. Um, the valley has developed uh, a light rail uh, line that comes down to um, Winchester, north of Los Gatos, and that's been like uh, to me. It's it's actually kind of uh, frustrating that every time I take that bus and I go to San Jose, I go right by the light rail. I go right by. Um, the Hamilton uh, light rail stop that you could, you could um, in theory, take bypass afternoon uh, rush hour uh, traffic jams on 280. Uh, so I'm just suggesting that in a future revision, they, they kind of address the, 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 the fact that that route hasn't been really, like any kind of uh, route changes haven't been um, um, uh, considered probably since it was first established. Do you just want to identify yourself for the uh, record? Bradley Snyder, uh, just a member of the public. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I just want to remind people we're talking about the Regional Transportation Plan, the 2040 Regional Transportation Plan. Kayla McNulty, um, speaking as a mother at this moment, and I want to express my concern about the way this um, plan is being put forward. I realize it's a perfunctory document. I did write to Chairman Leopold um, saying that I thought this was going to be an overstacked meeting today. I think this is an incredibly important document. I'm a parent. I think probably many of you are parents. Some of you might even be grandparents. This is about how we're going to give Santa Cruz County the opportunity to affect our own future. 
And the fact that we're rushing this through because we've got another important agenda item that people want to talk to is a problem. I think honestly, if we promoted this to the citizens climate lobby and I, you know, Greenway alone, we, we could fill several hours of public comment on this topic alone, but I wasn't able to put this out as something for our community to talk on because we need to talk on the topic that's coming up later in the agenda. So I think we're doing our community a disservice by just passing this through. And quite honestly, in reading it, I haven't had a chance to read through it thoroughly, but I find it really disappointing. I don't think we're aspiring to do nearly enough. To, if we want to affect greenhouse gases, we need a radical shift in thinking. And it is not what I see happening here in this county right now. So I hope that we can slow down. I honestly wish we would maybe redo this public meeting and make it someplace where more people would have the opportunity to comment. If we promoted it to the Citizens Climate Lobby, we could fill the Civic Auditorium. So, you know, just a thought. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Michael Saint from Aptos, uh, representing Campaign for Sensible Transportation. I'd like to second everything that Gail said. She was right on. And Mr. Bertrand, I want to make a comment about that graph. I agree with Mr. Bertrand that the scale should be started at 2011. I believe the graph went down in 08 and 9 and 7 because of the financial downturn. People stopped driving over the hill, basically, because they didn't have jobs. So. Start that graph at 11, I think you'll see something much different. Um, basically, I didn't want to come up here and spout numbers or give out handouts like I usually do. I wanted just to do a general uh, a consensus here. After reading the 2040 RTP, the plan is pretty clear what needs to be done. Um, now, all we have to do is put aside the politics, uh, which is harder for some than others, uh, put aside our differences, and find a common ground. We have a lot of smart, compassionate, hardworking people on this commission, on the staff, and in the audience and community. I believe we all want the same thing, an efficient and affordable transportation system, one that affords safety, convenience, reduces congestion, meets the goals set forth to combat climate change, and is sustainable. And I believe this is related to the UCS as well. Any project that does not meet the goals should be eliminated from the Unified Corridor Study and that money spent on a project that meets the goals of the 2040 RTP. You as commissioners have a huge responsibility to move us in a new direction and away from the old way of doing things and give us a different and new way to a sustainable transportation system. And for all of us here, it is time to stop talking the talk and walk the walk. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Barry Scott. I live in Aptos, and uh, I'll be brief. The uh, my friend Josh mentioned redundancy. But Santa Barbara, thank goodness for them that they had a rail line. Uh, during the mudslides, we sent uh, I, I, I think seven locomotives and 17 passenger cars so that they could they could manage some of their transportation needs. <laughs> there, but for the grace of God, go we. Uh, I think we're more prone to slides and earthquakes than Santa Barbara County. We're sitting on a rail line. When we look at the long-term needs of this county, both for sustainability and for safety and redundancy and reliability, um, I think we I think we're, we're tasked with with meeting our goals by using uh, in part by using our rail line. Um, the 2040 plan, uh, 10,000 UC students coming by 2040. The rail plan and and uh, Pajaro Station and what Monterey is doing. How can we not? keep our rail line and uh, use that to meet our 2040 goals. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else about the 2040 RTP, Regional Transportation Plan? Morning. Good morning and Happy New Year. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of Aptos. I want to second uh, Ms. McNulty's suggestion that you extend the public comment time for this document. Um, I, uh, I do not think that it has gone before the county's commission on the environment, which would make good sense to do, especially since the focus is to reduce greenhouse gases. So I would like to ask also for an extension of public comment time on this document. I would um, like to also point out in the report that 
AMBAG is the lead agency, I do plan to go to the January 30th um, hearing in Santa Cruz, but I have looked over some of that document, and in one of the attachments about growth goals, it actually reports that they project a population decrease in this area. So I'm, I'm kind of curious about all this and wondering where the information is coming from, how the modeling is being done, and how it will actually affect our county and your, your uh, commission's decisions in what to do. I want to urge you to uh, look at as many different solutions, creative solutions, as possible. And rather than studying them to death, actually put some money into doing pilot projects. Try things, see how they work, instead of just study them to death and throw money away. Thank you very much. Thank you. About the 2040 Regional Transportation Plan. <laughs> Robert Stevens from Aptos, and I just wanted to echo Bruce's concerns. Uh, we all have tons of desires on how to solve this through our transportation plan, but it's all going to take money and where is the money going to come from? Hopefully you can choose wisely in your decisions because we can't afford everything. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Bruce. Good morning. I'm Kerry Pico from Aptos. I actually don't have an opinion on this at all. However, I've heard that people were asking about Caltrans information. And some of you know that I now have an account at Caltrans I have all the Caltrans data for as many years as possible. I would be glad to give it to you, analyze it to you. I can tell you every five minutes, every lane, what the volume is, what the traffic is, whatever data is available online. It's free of charge. I don't have an angle on this at all. But if anybody's questioning the veracity of the data, I'm offering it, OK? And so many of you know how to reach me. And if not, you can ask my local representative, Zach Friend, and that's all I'm offering. So the data is different than what I hear from the RTC frequently, and that's why I dug into it, and I'd like to have it just clean and true. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I just want to, uh, I just, uh, if there are any more people, it should be about the 2040 Regional Transportation Plan. Um, if you want to speak to that, please come forward. I'm uh, Roxka Hartley. I represent Agron Bio and Bioenergy, where biodiesel produced in the city of Watsonville. And we're intending to ramp up production, and the rail line is absolutely essential to us for moving rail cars. We think we'll be moving about 700 rail cars a year by the end of this year. Some of those rail cars we would like to move north, and we think we might end up transloading fuel in the city of Watsonville, in Santa Cruz itself. Thank you very much. Thank you. The 2040 Regional Transportation Plan. Good morning. My name is Peter Stanger. Um, in the plan, uh, I was formerly a member of People Power, and then People Power changed its name to Bike Santa Cruz County. Uh, when I was a member, I asked for the um, nonprofit status, and I was told then that. Um, they were not a nonprofit, they were a political advocacy group, and that I could not write off um, my uh, dues to Bike Santa Cruz County because they're not a nonprofit. I bring this up only because in the 2040 regional plan, uh, in chapter two, page 20, regarding uh, transportation demand management, there's a sentence that says, partner agencies include local jurisdictions and nonprofits such as Ecology Action in Bike Santa Cruz County. And you might want to double check and make sure that they do have a IRS nonprofit status. Otherwise, the plan has a factual error. Thank you. Is there any more public comment? Seeing none. Oh. Oh. Uh -oh. I would definitely like to address uh, what I think is missing from this plan, and that's basically vision. Uh, you know, we're looking at a 25-year plan that, as far as I can tell, does not really provide the kind of vision that is necessary for this county. Uh, an obvious example is that, you know, the big debate in uh, our transportation world these days is whether or not it should be a train or no train, blah, blah, blah. 
And it's really a proxy fight over the freeway. The issue that I see is that we've got something like 100,000 people commuting or using the freeway every day, and our 25-year plan doesn't have any way of actually taking the lion's share of those people and allowing them to use alternative transportation on the freeway corridor. Um, uh, let's see here. Basically, two-thirds or something like that of you know the traffic coming through the middle of the county is going on to um, Silicon Valley or going on to Santa Clara County. And that there's really no alternative for the masses of people to uh, get to do anything but drive in a single uh, occupancy vehicle. So I really think that you know one of the most important things that this plan could do is address, uh, a, you know, truly address bus rapid transit and what it's going to take in the tier one process to make the modification of the freeway work in the future for bus rapid transit. So as uh, the highway is widened and there eventually are three lanes and you're coming back to replace all the overcrossings, those over overcrossings should consider what it's going to entail to get direct access ramps to where the majority of the traffic is going now, Dominican Hospital, Cubrillo College, uh, being able to connect to the Soquel and freeway corridors, being able to get to multimodal transit stations in Scotts Valley so that the highway connects eventually 217, Highway 1 connects 217 and connects to the valley. Anyway, uh, I really think that this group, in terms of vision, it's, you know, the real question is who owns the vision? Is it this, this body? Is it the RTC staff or is it the public? I think that there's a, a real disconnect between what is necessary in terms of getting on with it and doing something that's really going to move the needle in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and what we see as business of us as usual, which is pushing out these paper processes and going off 10, 15 years of planning that doesn't really address the, pro uh, the problems. I think that you really all can do better than this, and I think that you should uh, really think about that. There's a process problem, and it needs to be corrected. Thank you. Thank you. Last call for the 2040 Regional Transportation Plan. Seeing none, I will bring it back uh, uh, here uh, to the commission for questions or action. Uh, Supervisor, I mean, uh, Commissioner Schifrin. As I understand the, the, the staff recommendation, we were only supposed to hold a public hearing today and then individual um, commissioners w could submit, as, me as well as members of the public, could submit comments by February 5th on the plan. Is that correct? Correct. The public comment period is open from February 5th, and it started on December 8th. So I don't know if we need a motion, but if we need a motion to move on, I would so move. Uh, I don't think we need a mo motion. Uh, uh, if there's any comments that, that people want to share with, uh, with staff. I did have just one question. Uh, it, um, uh, Ms. Dykar, could you remind us about the process that went into the creation of the 2014 um, uh, Regional Transportation Plan, which this is built off of? So there were the 2014 Regional Transportation Plan for Santa Cruz County was a major update compared to the previous plans. We do go through the Regional Transportation Planning process every four years, but in 2014, um, we started probably, it was 2011, three years ahead of time, to rework the plan substantially by really kind of taking a look at um, the trends for what people are doing, and we worked very closely with the Sustainable Transport uh, with the Sustainable Transportation Council and using the STARS Sustainable Transportation Analysis Rating System, which really the um, the meat of that was looking more, much more closely at our goals, policies, and targets. Um, the, one of the things that's a real standout in my mind for the 2014 Regional Transportation Plan is that we developed targets for our plan to. Um, forecast if this project was implemented, how well w would we advance these um, goals and policies and would it meet those targets. All of that information is still incorporated into this plan. There's an appendix uh, D, I believe, that incorporates all of the performance measure analysis for how well we met the target for the 2014 Regional Transportation Plan. Um, so it's just a, a great process to go through to see how are we meeting these different goals and um, policies that we've developed. 
I think that's the big thing that we worked very closely with the Sustainable Transportation Council. Um, the planning process is, um, transportation planning process is a typically a three year process. You've uh, seen RTC staff come to you even for this plan, which is a minor update over the last number of years. We've come to you probably at least three or four times a year with the various different milestones of this project to get your input. Um, on each step so that as we bring the document together, um, you've already had some um, decision making about the project list, the policy element, the financial element, so that the, all of this can come together. We have to work very closely with AMBAG on this. The tr there's a travel demand model that's used in order to run all these projects that are in the project list. Everything takes time and um, we wanna make sure that there's uh, a process well in place for um, getting your input, getting the public input, all the advisory committee inputs um, to develop this plan. Does that okay. give you yeah, the no, I appreciate that. Uh, the, okay. the reason I asked about that is because they're also on our STARS uh, uh, rating system, which we were one of the first in the country to use. We also had an advisory group that was made up of some technical experts in uh, transportation policy, as well as business uh, members on, on that group. We held uh, community right. meetings right. around sustainability. We really restructured the document to, to be guided towards sustainability and having some metrics for the first time to look at our plan. Um, and this is a minor update. We'll be doing a, a, a major update in the next couple of years. Uh, but a lot went into this and it did lay the groundwork for us to be able to come up with um, uh, something to be able to go out to the voters to look to, to, to uh, uh, help fulfill that un uh, met a uh, financial need, which ended up being Measure D, uh, which uh, really helps us here in Santa Cruz County. And I encourage people to, to be involved, but the, the, the commission's been working on this document for a number of years. We actually adopted the STARS system in 2009. Um, and, uh, and we start, we, you know, so we, we, we've been working on this uh, for a while, and we will continue to evolve it over time. But I appreciate the work of staff and, and putting this forward. Anyone else? Mr. Rios. Just following on that, um, all of this is going to be in our uh, information network for all the people that raise the issue of not informing people enough. So I, I'm, my question is that from now until February 5th, right, there's going to be all the different networks where people can put their inputs, correct? There's, we have all information on our webpage. Um, we put out emails to um, Oh, it's about a four, at least 3,500 people that have um, expressed interest in this study. Um, what other outreach we do? We the with AMBAG, they've been provide, putting flyers out as far as the public hearing. So this, there's a, a lot of information out there about this process that we've been going through. So for those comments that were raised, that we need to inform more people, the networks are there for people to know about them now, and for. Um, at the vision view, people also have uh, the networks to put their vision to include it in the, in, the, in the comment period, correct? We will be looking at all the public comments that we've, we receive um, and that have been received over the past. We've um, looked very closely at the public comments to see if there's something missing, if we need to adjust. And um, I just want to mention that this public comment period was open December 8th after the December 7th meeting was when I brought um, the, this document to the commission to um, ask for the ability to release the document on December 8th. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you for, for your work and I uh, look forward to the meeting on January 30th. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll move on to item 20, which is a Santa Cruz branch uh, rail line replacement operator. There is a number of materials, a staff report, a notice of default to uh, Iowa Pacific Holdings, response from Iowa Pacific, uh, request for proposals for rail service operator with evaluation criteria, proposal from Progressive Rail, um, uh, the public comments we received, and the <coughs> other proposals are available online. Uh, good morning, Mr. Dondero. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. So. Um, we're, uh, Mr. Mendez and I are going to give a, um, a little bit of a con contextual introduction to this item before we actually get into the details of the staff report. Okay. So Luis is going to start to give uh, folks a little bit of history on this rail line because most of the commissioners here today were not on the commission back in 2012 when we took possession of the rail line. And so we, we, we think it would be good to 
sort of uh, revisit where how we got here today. So, Luis. Okay. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, some of you may know that in the late 80s, the, this county succeeded in its efforts to make sure it was included in a statewide bond measure to raise funds for radial transportation improvements and development. That was Proposition 116, which passed in 1990 with 53 percent approval by the uh, voters of the state of California and 60 percent approval by the voters in Santa Cruz County. And it included $11 million for Santa Cruz County for passenger rail projects. Um, a couple of decades later, in February uh, 2010, after you know, much work and many public meetings and much public participation, the RTC voted unanimously to request over $20 million in Proposition 116 and other transit funds from the California Transportation Commission for purchase of the rail line and for rail improvements to the rail line, uh, as well as to institute recreational passenger rail service. And in May 2010, after many years of negotiations, extensive due diligence, and many public meetings, including an evening uh, public hearing the month before, the RTC voted, again, unanimously to enter into a purchase and sale agreement with Union Pacific for the rail line, and that included commitments to continue freight service and make rail improvements to the line. Uh, a few months later, in August 2010, the RTC voted against unanimously to accept conditions imposed by the California Transportation Commission uh, to be able to consider uh, the, com the RTC's request for funding, and those conditions included the continuation of freight rail service as long as it is required by the Surface Transportation Board and the institution of recreational passenger rail service. Then, uh, finally, in January 2011, after much work by several commissioners here at the RTC to convince the California Transportation Commission that this was indeed a transit project worthy of funding as requested and assurances that the Santa Cruz County would not perform a bait and switch, the CTC approved funding for the purchase of and improvements to the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line with conditions, including that the RTC would refund the money if the RTC uh, ceased to utilize the project for the intended public passenger uh, rail purpose, and also requiring the RTC to add $250,000 in other funds for some acquisition costs. Two weeks later, uh, this commission again voted unanimously to approve the additional funds required by the CTC uh, to be able to accept the funding and the conditions of the CTC. Then in October of 2012, as many of you know now, the RTC, um, uh, after selecting an operator for the rail line and obtaining approval from the Surface Transportation Board, completed the purchase of the, of the rail line. Uh, and that uh, kicked off a extensive public process that lasted over, over two years uh, with many public meetings and much public participation, uh, which culminated in 2014 when the RTC approved a master plan and environmental document for the Monterey Bay Century Scenic Trail Network with um, the main component is a trail next to the rail line. And that master plan was also adopted by the county mm -hmm. and the three cities through which the rail line travels. And as you know, in 2016, over two thirds of Santa Cruz County voters. Secretary, it's hard to hear you in the back. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, then in, in 2016, as you know, over two thirds of Santa Cruz County voters approved Measure D uh, for funding of a variety of transportation projects, uh, and that included preservation of the rail corridor infrastructure and analysis of its future potential use to include analysis to answer community questions about possible future transit and other uses and to maintain and repair the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line. Now, RTC does have a policy in place regarding use of the rail corridor. It is stated clearly in the Mon Monterey Bay Century State Trail Master, Master Plan in Policy 1.2.4, which says develop trails in such a way so that future rail transit service along the corridor are not precluded. The master plan was adopted unanimously by the RTC and also by the cities of Watsonville, Capitola, and Santa Cruz. Um, so it is, it is policy. And the RTC has been consistent uh, with that policy and its commitments to use the Santa Cruz branch rail line for multiple transportation purposes, including rail service. And you know, even in the face of some um, uh, very vocal, active, and organized opposition, there has been significant community support 
for the commission's actions, including traveling to Sacramento to try to make sure that the CTC approved the funding uh, for the project. Um, and uh, with that, I'll hand over to the executive director to provide some additional. Okay, so um, coming up to uh, current times, um, I don't want to repeat anything that Luis said. It was a very thorough history. Um, but uh, more recently, the commission did conduct a rail transit feasibility study in 2015. And um, there are some uh, misconceptions about that. There's also some misconceptions about rail banking and what options the RTC is now considering uh, through the Unified Corridor Study. First, the feasibility study was not a proposal for rail transit. The hypothetical estimates in the study are not under consideration by RTC as options for the future. The study is not viewed as a blueprint for the future. The study was a theoretical look based on types of service for which data were available at the time at what was possible on the rail line. Also theoretical is the concept called rail banking. It sounds enticing to pull up the tracks now and then put them back someday in the future. The reality is, is that after thousands of miles of tracks have been torn up over the three decades since the term was coined by Congress, not a single mile of track is believed to have ever been replaced. While it's an attractive idea, the truth is that no one has ever seen rail return after it has been designated rail banks. So as Luis mentioned, Measure D, uh, which was approved by two thirds of the voters, includes funding for a public transparent study of options for use in the rail corridor. And that, that study is now underway and it's called the Unified Corridors Investment Study and it will be completed by the end of this year. But a couple of myths need to be addressed here. Uh, First, in the case of the rail with trail scenario, the study does not envision that the RTC will run trains immediately. It does envision the tracks will be preserved for future use if the community decided to pursue funding for rail service. Um, before drawing any conclusions on the best use of the rail line, the, the Unified Corridor Investment Study needs to be completed. It will inform the commissioners and the public about a recommended use of the corridor based on clear performance metrics. So one last point of confusion is that some people have the impression that when the RTC agree agreed to study a scenario of including a trail without rail service in the study, that somehow all use of the rail line would cease or that all prior commitments regarding rail operations would be set aside saying this because based on a lot of the public comments we've received through email, um, not only on this item, but in past months. For many reasons, that is clearly not the case, and hence the item before you today to choose a new operator <coughs> now that the current one is ready to leave. So with that, I will now hand it back to Luis, and he will walk you through quickly through the staff report so we can get on with the discussion. Thank you. As you know, commissioners, unfortunately, the financial situation of the existing operator on the rail line changed significantly, and they have not been able to fulfill the terms of the agreement. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I got to make sure I s sit here close to the mic. Sorry about that. Uh, so anyway, as you know, the uh, current operator has not been able to fulfill the terms of the agreement because their financial situation changed uh, significantly. Uh, and after providing notice uh, of default to the operator, they they responded by saying they would agree to cooperate with the RTC on transition to a new operator. Uh, therefore, a request for proposals was released to uh, seek a new operator. Five proposals were, re were received and reviewed, and the evaluation of the proposals by the RTC staff and a uh, RTC rail consultant um, resulted in the proposal by Progressive Rail rising to the top as the strongest uh, proposal. Uh, the proposal from Progressive Rail demonstrates significant experience managing, maintaining, and operating rail properties. The service plan is reasonable for both freight and passenger operations and shows gradual uh, planned growth in addition of service. Uh, the team also inspected the track and structures, and so they know what the, they know what they're getting into and the needs that are that are out there. And they provide an outline uh, for uh, how they would they would do things. Now the. RTC uh, staff also uh, checked references uh, for Progressive Rail and found that they had pretty much uh, the same experience as we have here in San Cruz County elsewhere. In, uh, in North Carolina, there was also an operation, Bio Pacific, where they 
pretty much the same thing as they did here because of their financial situation, racked up a, a lot of unpaid bills and basically left a lot of bad will towards uh, rail service. Uh, and the uh, North Carolina Department of Transportation uh, decided to, through an RF, to go through an RFP process, and through that process, they selected Progressive Rail as well, and they've been out there for, I believe, a little over a year now. And the reports that we got from that reference check were very, very positive, and they were very impressed with uh, the activities of Progressive Rail, the work they have done so far to uh, uh, make sure that some of the freight service that was uh, slated to leave as a result actually did not leave, and to you know, start creating you know, positive uh, and goodwill uh, towards uh, rail service in the community again. So they're very pleased uh, you know, with the work of uh, Progressive Rail. Therefore, staff does recommend that the RTC select Progressive Rail to operate the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line and authorize the executive director to negotiate an agreement with Progressive Rail and return to the RTC for consideration of a negotiated agreement. And I just want to highlight that your action today does not you know, indicate approval of any agreement. It's the authorization to start negotiating an agreement with this operator if you so, uh, you know, choose that uh, the staff recommendation and that approval of the agreement would come back uh, to the RTC. Um, also, uh, Progressive Rail wanted to um, say, um, you know, a few, th a few things and make a short presentation to you if that that's okay. Yes. Morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, uh, commissioners. Uh, my name is Craig McKenzie. I'm the chairman and CEO of Progressive Rail, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here where it's 40 degrees warmer than, than our, our headquarters is in Minneapolis. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to make a brief presentation. The, the goal of the presentation here is to provide a snapshot of Progressive Rail and to also uh, discuss how we're approaching Santa Cruz uh, from the outside. Um, after the presentation, I would be happy to field any questions you may have. And in that regard, I bring uh, two members of our executive team. One is Jim Thornton, <coughs> Chief of Staff and General Counsel. And the other is Jeremy Erlacher, our Managing Director of Operations Services. Jeremy is a civil engineer by training and has personally inspected all of the branch line, all 32 miles of it, including the bridges, and has also brought in an outside engineering firm from uh, Irvine uh, to do rail inspections, including uh, the trestle and Capitola. Um, with respect to progressive rail, here's a snapshot uh, in, in, this, um, in this photo, or uh, excuse me, in this uh, illustration, you can see that we have 10 railroads uh, in six states, uh, one that uh, Lewis was mentioning a while ago is in, is in Gastonia, uh, North Carolina. Gastonia is a suburb of, of Charlotte. And uh, in three of our railroads, we are the operator for municipalities. And in that case, we are actually the operator for the uh, North Carolina Department of Transportation. In terms of our company, how we go about business, we go beyond rail and also uh, have services that provide warehousing. We also um, have transloading services and also uh, we uh, modify products from uh, in one of our lines of business. We actually do processing and uh, packaging of, of animal feed. Union Pacific is very familiar with us as the commission is aware uh, Union Pacific interchanges with the branch line, and we are Union Pacific's largest uh, handling carrier by carload volume. And so they're very familiar with us. We are uh, used to working with them. Should come as no surprise that we are pro rail. Uh, we are a green enterprise. We don't just talk about it, we actually put it into action. We have uh, modern technology, diesel electrics, 
Uh, so essentially think of uh, locomotives as hybrids. Uh, one of our railroads is all electric. It's the last uh, great railroad run off of electricity in North America. And that, that's in Northern Iowa. Have a not so secret mission of taking trucks off the, off the highways. We don't mind last mile trucking because we do um, focus on customers who are not directly on the line, but uh, we do connect them with last mile trucking. And, uh, but every time you see a long 100 car train, you can think that it's taking 400 trucks off the highways. With respect to being resilient, um, our locomotives don't care about the weather. Uh, we have uh, redundancy in our systems. We are very dependable and, uh, and can be counted upon to move freight uh, expeditiously. Uh, with respect to passengers, um, mass transit favors rail service, and we think there is a bright future here uh, in this county for, uh, for mass transit, for rapid transit with trains. But for us, we just see ourselves as a bit of a segue, a meaningful segue uh, in that regard. do think of ourselves as a as different from the competition in terms of rail service we don't just build uh, and restore rail lines uh, we go beyond that so many times we are faced with railroads that are near abandonment or have been underutilized and so what we do as a first step is restore the integrity of the railroad and then we start addressing customers and welcoming them back to rail service. Many industrial users of, of freight transportation have forgotten how to use railroad. It used to be commonplace, but now trucking is so easy. And so we have gone out of our way to make it easy. And so what we do is focus on comprehensive solutions to customers, from last mile trucking, to warehousing, to transloading, to uh, at points in time investing directly in our customers to, to enable them to actually go about their business. And, uh, and also we connect them with the class one railroads, making it easy for them. We invest in equipment, in real estate, in buildings. We restore buildings. Uh, some of the photos in, in this slide are examples. Uh, the top one is what was known as the Ampi building is now become Red Diamond. And it was a 100 plus year old warehouse where we hauled out over 40 um, um, uh, dumpster loads of refuge. And we have turned it into a showcase um, of, of, of transloading and processing um, uh, services. Uh, the middle photographs is a, uh, on the left side is a before picture of the Wisconsin Northern Railroad. It was near abandonment. On the right side uh, is a recent photograph of that railroad, and it is, I believe it's number six in, in, in short line um, uh, car load um, uh, capacity today, number six in the country. So uh, it, it's a, it is certainly our crown jewel in, in, our, in our company, and it, it's a great showcase of what we stand for. And the last one is, uh, is Gastonia, uh, the suburb of Charlotte. There's a before and after, and this is why the North Carolina Department of Transportation is very happy with us, because we've taken essentially what was a crack house and uh, turned it into um, a, a very reputable transloading center. Focusing on Santa Cruz, Safety, rail integrity, um, these, these principles are, uh, are paramount to what we do. And so we don't cut corners, we do everything straight down the middle. We go beyond uh, the integrity of what's needed. Uh, Commissioner, you're asking about um, Watsonville, the integrity of the rail. Um, it is FRA compliant, uh, it is legal and it, it serves the purpose for, for the freight, but I would assert that uh, Progressive Rail will have an even higher standard for that rail. We, um, we go 
beyond what is needed for FRA uh, compliance. In terms of how we would approach Santa Cruz, we think, uh, we think there's a number of steps and, and a continuum that are prudent uh, for this county with respect to the rail. So first of all, we would focus on Watsonville, you know, where the operations exist, but we think they can be so much better. And we've, we've begun our journey already in terms of identifying new areas of freight, both inbound into Watsonville and outbound. Uh, a second step in the continuum would be excursions. And I can appreciate uh, this commission is more focused on transportation than tourism, but I would like to just say that there's a connectivity between the two ideas. And what we would like to do is welcome people back to the railroad welcome them back to the branch line and focus on areas that we think are, are the easiest um, uh, first steps, uh, which, are, which would be the rail line uh, west of Santa Cruz towards Davenport. And we believe excursions in that area uh, would uh, certainly uh, be enticing in their, in their own regard, but also be a meaningful segue because <laughs> Even just to get equipment to that area, you're going to have to focus on the railroad integrity of the entire line upstream of that area. And then also, uh, people in this room or on the commission may recall the suntan uh, specials that uh, connected San Jose to the boardwalk. We have a goal to reinstate that. We've already begun that process uh, just through our research and, and communications or, or meetings with, uh, with relevant parties. And we think it would also be uh, a good contribution to reducing uh, traffic on Highway 1 and Highway 17 uh, during the summer, the peak summer months. Um, so uh, obviously in the continuum further down the line is rapid transit. Uh, we leave it uh, to the commission to flesh that out. And of course you have some studies underway that will come out later in the year. Uh, we see ourselves as a meaningful transition and segue towards that. With respect to rails and trails, uh, uh, my simple message to the, the commission is that Progressive Rail stands at the ready to help you, to facilitate it, to play an active role uh, as directed. Um, rails and trails um, can easily coexist. There's uh, numerous examples across the country uh, where this is occurring. Uh, the photographs in this slide are close to our headquarters. Um, and this is uh, the line uh, on the shoreline of uh, Lake Superior, where uh, you have uh, rails and trails um, uh, coexisting for uh, dozens of miles. We hope 2018 will be a very busy year for us. We would like to hit the ground running. In this um, illustration, what we're trying to show is how we would go about uh, taking first steps to focus on the entire line. And it would start from the right-hand side, focusing on warehousing and freight services in Watsonville. Again, there are existing operations. You heard the gentleman earlier with biodiesel. We have, uh, we have uh, service in mind for, for uh, that company's growth, as well as uh, enticing new customers to the area. Uh, across the line, we're going to be focusing on equipment, on, uh, on, on car selection, and obviously uh, with, with the highways and the pedestrians, we would focus on crossings and, uh, and signals. We have our own internal department. Uh, who handles this. this is a very important area uh, with regard to our operations. So uh, some things we outsource, uh, but in areas like this, we have our own standalone teams that, that uh, bring it all in-house and, and focus on the integrity of these areas. Capitola Bridge, um, that bridge is, um, is 115 years old, uh, thereabouts. And we have inspected it with, uh, with American Railroad engineers out of Irvine, California. And we have essentially started building up uh, our baseline uh, understanding of that bridge, along with all the bridges uh, on the line. Uh, we will uh, work with the boardwalk, uh, 
the suntan special is not just going to fall from the sky. It's going to take a lot of work and effort to bring it back. And like I said, we've, we've begun work efforts on that. And then focusing on the western end of the line, uh, it's going to take some time to be prepared to put forward high quality, uh, pleasurable excursions that, uh, that would be a great experience for everyone. This is my uh, last two slides. Uh, I think we're going to have a very positive impact, uh, not just for this commission, but for the county. We're going to be uh, a direct investor in the, in the county. Uh, and from that, there will be indirect investments, knock on or follow on investments that <coughs> follow us. We're going to be a, a direct employer uh, and also a sizable indirect employer with the activities that we have planned. So with the maintenance programs, with, the, with any rebuildings or, or repairs, uh, and then getting into the warehousing and so forth, we think uh, that this operation will follow suit just like our other operations. We become a meaningful uh, employer and source of economic development uh, in the counties and, and, and municipalities where we operate. And uh, we're going to increase the tax base of uh, this area. Tourism will benefit. Uh, it, we, uh, we will have a positive impact on all the industries that support tourism. And, and with respect to your scenic beauty that you have here, we think that we could have a positive impact on those areas as well with, res with regard to security, waste management, safe passage, signage. It, it, we're not just a railroad, and that's a point I want to keep reinforcing. We, we try to think of exactly what it all takes and how it needs to come together. We don't want to step into the role and usurp government, but we stand at the ready to help. Uh, with regard to these two photographs, the top one's just a, a rendering, and the bottom one is, is uh, an actual photograph in San Diego uh, showing the rail line and uh, pedestrians. And um, again, um, I think a, a solid fringe benefit of everything that we're trying to do is going to be a reduction of, of traffic and a reduction of greenhouse gases. <coughs> My last slide, I'm just offering a, a high-level timeline for our efforts. In this first quarter, we're going to focus on the negotiations and STB approval. And also, we'd be meeting with the FRA to establish a baseline. And, um, and obviously, both processes are very familiar to us. Uh, it's what we've done many times over. We'll focus on Watsonville. We'll focus on a summer program for the, um, for the repair programs uh, and the maintenance that's needed on the entire railroad. Um, 2018 excursions will take quite a bit of effort, and we would start immediately in the, in the planning stages. We do have a strategic alliance with uh, American Heritage Railroad, who's the largest excursions um, uh, railroad company in North America. And so with them uh, in, in tow, we would uh, do this in the right way, in the, in the highest quality manner possible. And we obviously would, uh, would support uh, the outcomes of your, uh, your studies. And, and lastly, um, you know, with the suntan special, it's going to be a comprehensive uh, undertaking that's going to involve Capital Corridor, TAMC, um, um, uh, Caltrans, and so forth. And so it, it, it would uh, be a major undertaking. It's going to take some time to put together. So in conclusion, uh, Progressive Rail is, is here to help this commission. We would uh, it'd be a privilege and honor to be the operator and we would like to deliver upon your priorities. We have our own standards that go far beyond um, just uh, minimum threshold compliance, and we would invite uh, any of the commissioners to come see us in action. Uh, you can come to any of, our, any of our railroads and see us and see how we operate and see how, um, uh, how we go about our business, and also talk to customers and municipalities who have experience with us. Um, with respect to um, uh, you know, the forward um, uh, actions, uh, we will do everything in lockstep with the commission and, and also not get, a, not get ahead of any studies, but be there to support and, and collaborate and, uh, and be there uh, uh, as a responsive corporate citizen in this county.
Thank you very much. Are there questions that people have for uh, um, uh, Progressive Rail? Uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair. So um, I had a, uh, you have forecasts here, by the way, welcome to, uh, can everybody hear me? Welcome to um, Santa Cruz County. I was looking on the financials in terms of um, storage and rental. And last night at our city council meeting, we had a we had a presentation from Save Our Shores, in which they were talking about the real problems of offshore drilling. And with the prior carrier, there were, were issues with some of the oil tankers that were on the line that uh, presented uh, somewhat of a clear and present danger to places like in Watsonville, the slough, and, and so forth. Take me through um, the whole idea of storage and rental and what your vision is. I noticed in your forecast from 2018, you're looking at right around 105,000, but ramps up to about a million dollars by uh, 2022. Um, does that represent, you know, 10 cars uh, on average, uh, 20, 100? And because you brought it up, I also want to mention the rail and trail because it was illustrated here. Um, in your vision, if there was a rail and trail, and with the trail, if people wanted to ride their bikes, would there be uh, massive numbers of, of, of just rail cars sitting there for their pleasure? Um, to me, that's something of a problem. I just kind of want to get what your vision is and, and the number of storage cars that $1,016,000 represents. Commissioner, just to clarify, that line item in that projection is not rail car storage. Rail car storage does not feature in our Ford plan. As a company, we have done rail car storage on occasion during downturns of the economy. You know, a, a problem that exists in those periods is rail cars need to be parked somewhere and they can't stay on the main lines and, and, and block the, um, the, the passage of, of freight trains. Uh, so we have done rail car storage, but it is not a feature, a main feature of what we stand for or what we try to drive income from. So we have no projections of, of uh, rail car storage. So would what, you exclude those from your... Yeah, so what, what those line items are is, pertains to warehouse storage. And, um, and so warehouses are a feature of what we stand for and what we uh, drive income from. So the, um, so the warehouse storage of product, we, we receive rents, basically. And as this um, um, aspect of our company grows, and we anticipate it to do the same as our other uh, railroads, we anticipate getting meaningful income from that. And it would include the red, the red diamond um, uh, subsidiary that we have, where we actually process and package product, uh, which we anticipate uh, being uh, a meaningful business here, uh, with respect to um, uh, both feed and uh, and also uh, agricultural users. Uh, uh, Commissioner Rapkin. I'm impressed that you um, brought not only your yourself but you know, your chief counsel and people at the top of your firm. Your headquarters are in Minnesota. Um, you operate in other states, and you said I think six states. Um, what kind of presence from the organization itself would we expect during this sort of planning process and after you're actually running a railroad here of some kind? Um, would you expect to have a headquarters? Or, I mean, what I. I don't have any sense at all of how you operate a national organization where you had an operation here in a little community. I would welcome moving our headquarters here. <laughs> <laughs> um, at least this week for sure. <laughs> I have to talk to the owners. Um, so um, there's going to be a continuum with regard to employment and how we go about business. So day one, we would need to set up uh, an office and have presence primarily in the operations teams and the maintenance teams. We do have centralized functions out of our headquarters. And in, so all of the back office, the administration, finance, legal, and so forth are based there. 
and, um, and we have centralized uh, teams that include mechanical and maintenance of way and, um, and transloading and so forth. But as we start building uh, some scope and scale here, we would start employing more. And so my request would be, be patient, give us about a year or so to, to find our feet and let us start um, you know, getting some traction with bringing people back to rail. Typically in the past, it's taken about three years for us to really find our stride. Um, but in this area, we, we think we have it properly assessed in terms of uh, not only customers in our network that we think that want to locate here, and also uh, with regard to how we can um, basically bring some of the agricultural aspects <coughs> of, the, of the industry here uh, back to rail. Look at where uh, the warehousing in, in Watsonville and see that essentially almost everyone's gone to trucking. And so uh, we have experience in doing the opposite and also working with uh, class ones, in particular Union Pacific, to create sort of bespoke dedicated corridors for expediting freight. So in the case of perishable fruits and vegetables, uh, there used to be a salad bowl express here. And so we would aim to uh, reinst uh, reinstate some of that. Uh, we've had some introductory conversations on the idea with Union Pacific, they've been receptive. They are much more receptive to boxcar freight now than they've been in a long time. And so we think that plays right into this specific, uh, this item. And then also with regard to, um, you know, how we would go about um, supporting agriculture from the inbound, uh, fertilizer, plastic mulch, and so forth. Commissioner Brown. Thank you for putting together a really impressive uh, report for us to consider. Um, and I just want to ask a quick question, or if you could maybe just give a little bit of information because I feel like I missed something in terms of your engagement with the communities that are going to be affected by potential, especially the excursion services that you're talking about. There are some small communities that are going to experience significant impact as a result of that. So if you've talked with them, if you plan to begin to talk with them, just wondering. So have we spoken to any of the communities uh, to date? The answer is no. We didn't want to get ahead of the commission. But as a matter of practice, uh, we're open and transparent. We would like to take everyone on our journey. We would like to engage them to see the merits and deal with any of the issues head on. Um, so we're not opaque in any regard. Um, we, we understand the impact of both uh, noise or, um, or with regard to uh, the number of patrons that might be involved, uh, hopefully, on some of these excursions. We'd like to also see, you know, focus on the flip side of that and engage on the positive aspects as well. Uh, you know, tourism is a natural thing here, um, uh, from the boardwalk to the beaches. We would like to just sort of weave our way into that fabric and, and be a part of it, not intrusive, uh, but also after some period of time, make it seem as if we're always here. Uh, the startup is usually uh, dramatic, sometimes overly dramatic. Uh, at the end of the day, we're kind of here and gone in minutes uh, in terms of the train service and so forth. Uh, we'd like to go about this the right way. We would welcome having um, collaborative discussions with special interest groups and various municipalities. Happen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you you came out from Minnesota? Yes, yes, we flew in. Okay. Yes. How, how do you like it here? <laughs> like it very much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought that was clear. <laughs> you know, we're I, staying at the Dream Inn, so uh, what's there not to like? You know, yeah. I saw about 100 surfers out there yesterday. That, that, um, are there no sharks here? Population control. Anyway, welcome, uh, welcome here. And I'll make this quick. <clears throat> and, and that'll allow people in the public to speak. And uh, so I'll hold it to a minimum. We are not making a decision today uh, to make that clear to everybody. Uh, we're not voting on a, on a contract today. We're looking and just reviewing everything right now, right? 
That is correct. The decision for you today is not to vote on a contract, but to actually authorize negotiating a contract. And then, uh, real quick, uh, Suntan uh, Special. Uh, I guess you, we all realize that it would have to go through Watsonville. It can't go over the Santa Cruz Mountain. Not over the pass anymore. Not since 1941 or two or whatever it was. Um, it, that would be too treacherous, in particular in the, in, well, first of all, the rail's not there. But uh, to try and reinstate it, uh, you'd really be subjected to um, your winter storms. The safer, faster uh, uh, pathway is actually to go down around the mountains um, and back up. Uh, when they changed from through the pass to down around Watsonville, uh, it only added 20 minutes to the historic suntan special. And so um, that's a fast corridor now from San Jose uh, going south. And we would like to um, get, either get trackage rights or uh, coordinate with one of the existing carriers and, um, and use Watsonville essentially as the turnaround point to go back up. And then quickly, uh, excursions uh, would be basically uh, from Aptos to Santa Cruz in the beginning because uh, we really couldn't get a train all the way from Watsonville going all the way to Santa Cruz right now, right? Uh, there is some damage on the, on the track, that's, that's correct. And as we was mentioning before, staff is working to, to repair those damages. Uh, and right now, there isn't any equipment that can that can get beyond, you know, just a uh, little past Watsonville. And that that would come under setup. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, work with uh, RTC to restore railroad. That 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 really should be like phase one or whatever. Thank you, uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Rios, and then Bertram. Maybe it's a silly question. Thank you very much for your presentation. Why do you want to come here with all these regulations and a lot of opposition and people don't want it, some people, and you're taking a chance and all this stuff, why? Well, so, first of all, it's what we do. <laughs> uh, we've made a, 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 a very successful enterprise out of doing exactly this. This would not be the first time we've dealt with opposition uh, the line that I was describing as our crown jewel uh, primarily hauls frac sand. And it was um, uh, town meetings and, and forums just like this one, uh, in which we just put forward the positives and the negatives. And hopefully at the end of the day, everyone can understand that there's a net positive impact. It's hard. We, we don't have any illusion to think that everything's perfect <coughs> in what we do. But on balance, we think it's usually the smart thing to do, and that's what we stand for. So we're not shy about this sort of engagement. We just like to do it the right way and be transparent about it. So we're happy to be here. Commissioner Burkhan. So I'm impressed with your business model in terms of rediscovering railroad. So it seems like you are fitting into a niche for the class one carriers in the sense they can't do the last half mile or a mile. Is, is that how you characterize it? Yeah, so there's a couple of different dimensions to answer uh, your question directly. Um, <coughs> we, we hunt and gather um, uh, customers for the class ones that they essentially don't do anymore. They're <laughs> glad to receive on occasion, glad to receive inbound inquiries, but they don't uh, really go out and seek new customers like they used to. It used to be a natural part of their business. It's not quite the same anymore. And so we fulfill that aspect. And then the second aspect is more operational, operationally. Mm -hmm. We provide service 24 seven on demand as customers need it. Um, one car, two cars, 10 cars, 100 cars. We don't really have a limitation. And we don't keep track of operating ratios and so forth like the class ones do because mm -hmm. they're all public. Mm -hmm. They're all catering to Wall Street and they're trying to keep all their metrics to look like they're, they're very efficient and, and, and wise users of, of, of shareholder capital. For us, uh, we don't have to track that. We just, we, we care about the type of service. We care about safety, obviously, and integrity. And, and we do that uh, as a complement to the class one since 
they don't have the wherewithal anymore to do that on their own because it's for them it's diminishing returns. Okay, some follow up. So would this, um, as you develop more of this particular customer base, would this result in uh, more jobs in Watsonville uh, on a significant level? You're talking about pack and break or repackaging, uh, reprocessing. I mean, can you describe that a little bit more? Because that could be of great benefit in Watsonville. It would come in phases. So in the beginning, we have in mind uh, some restoration to the rail that we would like to undertake. And so with that, you have crews and so forth. When we start getting into warehousing, which we think we've identified a warehouse that we'd like to go after and secure, uh, then you start getting into um, more multiples of, of, of employees, you start getting into the dozens of employees. Uh, when you get into excursions, uh, then you start really uh, branching out and expanding the employment base because you need support, you need uh, the entertainment aspect, you need the, the ticketing aspect, the safety aspect, uh, it starts to really start to blossom. So uh, at some point it starts to feed on itself. The, the trick is always just to catalyze it in the beginning. Okay, thanks. So I notice on one of your, um, on your org chart, uh, Air Lake Terminal Railway, uh, what's the story there? I looked it up, it's a very short line, but it's inactive. Can you tell us the story of that, or would you, excuse me? So uh, Air Lake, is where our where our headquarters is. It is active. Oh, but this particular line, at least on the org chart, says inactive. Oh, sorry. Uh, that's as a legal entity. Oh, but, okay. But sorry. Because it's up at the parent. Okay, uh, got it. So okay, so it's handed at the. Okay, got it. That is our headquarters. Mm -hmm. uh, so some of the photographs in in our submittal uh, show our headquarters. That is Air Lake, and I'd just like to mention that when we entered Air Lake. There was nothing there, uh, and and through our direct efforts, through us being the first movers, we not only brought the rail back to service, we increased uh, all the warehousing capabilities, which fed trucking, which then brought in more customers. And now, if you drive through Air Lake, and again, I would invite any of the commissioners to come see this, <coughs> uh, it is a it is the busiest industrial area of Minneapolis uh, today. Uh, in this, this is in the southern suburbs of Minneapolis, and it's a thriving area. The people have sort of forgotten that it was us, but uh, but but it's all around us now. So uh, another one. So I'm very impressed that you're able to work with um, uh, civil organizations such as RTC, um, the state, I believe, uh, Southern Carolina, which Carolina, or well, Raleigh, uh, what, what what state or oh, what? North Carolina, North Department Carol of Transportation. Yes. yes. So um, that's particularly important to us here. Um, do you see particular challenges working with, you know, a civil entity and all that that may entail with so much participation from the public as opposed to just a business entity? Well, you know, in any business situation, you have more parties and, and, and more stakeholders. It becomes more sophisticated and requires more effort. Uh, we're not shy about that. We just need to make sure that everyone's aligned with what we're doing. Uh, we're very happy working for municipalities or working for government. We, we, we provide a service that they don't want to undertake themselves. In that regard, it's complimentary. In the case of North Carolina, North Carolina uh, DOT, um, you know, we've, we're coming up on a year. Uh, it's a fantastic relationship. Uh, we are doing things for them that they haven't even thought of. And, uh, and, and as a result, they have opened more doors for us. And so they're allowing us to branch out and spread our wings, which feeds us more business, which allows us to do even more work. And then that it even impresses them more. And so it, it starts to build momentum. Okay, thank you very much, sir. I, I just had uh, uh, maybe one or two short questions. Your plan uh, uh, looks about creating quiet zones. Uh, you know, we've had other operators where horns have been um, uh, very impactful. Um, you talked about working with the jurisdictions to help those quiet uh, zones happen. Um, how long does that usually take and what would be re the requirements on the other jurisdictions to be able to participate in this? And um, I took a chance in putting this in our submittal because I can appreciate it's, it, it's, it's a hot topic uh, typically. And in particular in this area, uh, you know, there's um, you know, a serene aspect to it, and uh, and a an air horn is not necessarily uh, <laughs> uh, complementary to that. 
Um, so in the first instance, there are different types of horns, and so some of them are more obnoxious than not. Um, so uh, I just want to say that as a very small step. Uh, with regard to quiet zones, you know, the, we as an operator won't have the capacity to instate that. It has to come from the, the municipalities themselves. What we would be happy to do is basically champion it, organize it, and work with the FRA. Uh, the FRA will have to absolutely sign off on how you go about it and so forth. But, but you know, there's nothing stopping from Capitola uh, through, um, say, Swift Street um, in Santa Cruz uh, to instate a quiet zone there. It would, it would, it would take millions of dollars. And so I want to be clear about that. But the crossings can be organized. And you can, uh, you can either go fully quiet or you can go down to sort of bell chime, uh, like, like happens in some uh, uh, mass transits and, uh, and some of the trams. Um, so there's different levels of, of quiet that you can go about. Um, it would usually take a couple of years to put in place, and it would be a significant undertaking in its own regard. But we can't get in the way of municipalities, we can facilitate it, and ultimately it, it comes down to the, uh, the county or the cities themselves okay. uh, to champion it, and uh, we would just like to help make it happen if it's an important objective. If it's not, then, then, then it's not. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I want to, um, uh, Commissioner Bertrand, I want to make sure to get to the public. Uh, the, the, just the, one more question. Do you have a, a brief question? question? Yeah. Very brief, uh, sort of at the heart of what a lot of people in this community are focused on right now. So I noticed from your uh, timeline chart, you recognize that the uh, Unified Corridor Study is going to be coming out, and that's later in this year. So if it went in the way of, you know, it's just not economically feasible for us to have a rail line on our current corridor from Davenport to Watsonville, um, I'd like to know your response to that. And the second part of that question is, do you think a component of your business could exist standalone just out of Watsonville, providing all the, the uh, you know, the, the jobs there, the, the, you know, packing and stuff like that for the uh, class one carriers? So that's sort of what I'd like you to address. Well, so can't predict the future. But no, neither but can we. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, we will respect the outcome. And obviously, if there's no railroad, then there's no need for an operator. Um, but uh, you know, we're, we're taking a calculated risk that the uh, outcome of that study or st uh, number of studies, uh, if it turns into that, uh, will be favorable towards rail because we think the, the, it is um, a meaningful and obvious, uh, in our eyes, um, a solution for going forward on both rate, uh, excuse me, freight and passengers. Uh, with regard to if there's no rail, uh, then we would be glad to honor the wishes of the RTC in that regard. Uh, if you're asking me what do we think about narrowing down the operations just to Watsonville, correct? Uh, that would be uh, disappointing to us, just to be very clear about that. We would like to actually have railroads come back to life. So again, that's sort of what we stand for. Uh, but, you know, we need some runtime in Watsonville to actually uh, catalyze it and get it going. It could be fine. Okay, thanks. That's, that's what I was looking for. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, um, just uh, welcome to Santa Cruz. Thank you for your presentation and thank you for having the guts to come into this subject matter, which is probably the most controversial one in the county about the rail line and how it's going to be used. I didn't uh, know that when I got on the plane. Yeah, right. Oh. <laughs> Well, um, but in, in light of uh, the, the two previous operators being primarily freight operators, and this is going to be really started or um, dependent on freight operations, have, and I, I understand the, the um, responsibility we have for freight service uh, according to the Service Transportation Board, but I have no any indication, and you, you said you're going to be talking with you, you want to have these, uh, the agricultural community in particular come back to freight service, but I have no indication that they really want to go there, and um, it just me, makes me uneasy that are we going to just do this all over again for the third time? And that's not a, a direct an attack on yours, your, op, your company or anything, I'm just very uncertain that this turnaround will take place to give you the foundation for a successful operation. I don't know. I just haven't heard that from the staff. I haven't heard it 
nobody's come to me to say, yes, this is great, let's go. Uh, I, I'm an agricultural operation and I really wanna, this, I'm gonna switch, I'm gonna sell my trucks and go to rail. I, there's no indication of that at all. And uh, I'm uncomfortable of, without that. And your comment is one that we've heard before because as, as I was mentioning earlier in my remarks, uh, people have forgotten how to use rail. You can call up a truck and usually get a rate in 30 minutes. A lot of times for rail, it might take 30 days. So the world doesn't work that way easily. It takes a lot of planning and preparation. And so therefore, uh, what we have to do is basically do all the hard work, all the legwork, bring it all together as a solution. And this is what I meant by a comprehensive solution and go to the customer and have the right conversation. You are spending this much on trucking, getting whatever product inbound or wherever you're taking it outbound. Here's what we can do for you. Let's try a, a let's go through a pilot and do a couple of rail cars and see if it works for you. Great, that worked, let's go do some more. Let's do more. Hang on, this customer here is doing it. What am I missing? And then it starts to feed on itself. So that this is what we've seen time and time again and I would, absolutely welcome you to come visit us and see this. Uh, and I can bring you to, um, to uh, you know, uh, different operations within our railroad that started out just like what you're describing. I'm not interested in going to Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> not the junket he's used to. All right. um, well, thank you very much for the presentation. I do want to give a chance for us to hear public comment. Uh, we may have you come back up for other, other questions. Um, I'd like to get a, a show of hands of how many people would like to, to make comments. Um, so we'll, we'll, we will probably limit comments to two minutes. Um, uh, before you get up there, Mr. Peoples, the, there were two young children who have been very well behaved, and I want to honor that and ask them to, to, uh, to, to come up first, because, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, so my name is Ryan Hoffman. I'm a resident of Live Oak for the past decade. These are my daughter and son. And so I'm speaking to you as a resident of Santa Cruz and also representing the future here. So I would urge you to consider your actions, the information, and not make any long-term commitments until the full scope of the UCIS is completed. Um, the reason for that, we all have the same interests. We want to reduce traffic. We want to be environmentally friendly. We want to accommodate future growth. We want options for the future. I don't deny the overall utility of rail, but I have great concerns about the sacrifices of what could potentially be an amazing trail. Um, so, being in Live Oak, I live near to Shoreline Middle School, Del Mar Elementary, the Boys and Girls Club, the Simkin Swim Center, and I have a very hard time imagining a train busting right through there. Um, I do think that a trail would really serve the future, and I think it would be an amazing thing for our town. I also have concerns about the information we have to rely on. When the best resource we have, the feasibility study, the analysis, the scenarios, it's called theoretical or hypothetical. What is the public to believe? So the time that's been put into this, the effort, the cost, and here we are. I wish we had more information that was more objective, data-driven, more evidence to go from. And I think that's really spurred a lot of this debate, this divisiveness. So I urge you to, to take your time, do the UCIS, give us information that we can use, and all get behind a common solution that benefits us all. So thank you. Thank you, and thank you for. We appreciate your skills as a father and the, and the uh, the uh, patience of your children. So, thank you, <laughs> Brian Peoples with Trail Now. I'm here to uh, deliver uh, from the office of Heron and Lloyd, uh, who represents the farmers um, for the rail trail going up from Davenport to Santa Cruz. A complaint that uh, basically they're against um, the train going to Davenport. They realize that it will um, violate the current EIR that is going on. And I just want to um, submit this to the forum, to the commission, as well as to inform you that that will jeopardize the e completion of the EIR and it could lose $6.5 million federal grant. I also want to say that I think there was some misconceptions on the submittal we submitted. Uh, be in trail now. We submitted a, we have submitted a proposal to maintain the rail line, um, subcontract to a rail operator 
Fort Watsonville operations, which we've already been in discussions with a qualified rail operator. Um, we would work with the community. We'd bring $2.3 million to protect our corridor. There are over 20 trestles that is valuable to our community. If a tree falls and hits one of those trestles, we're going to lose a great asset. We need to protect that. And that's what our proposal was about. It wasn't just to come in and pull up the tracks. It was actually to maintain the rail line forever, indefinitely. We can do that. And that's what our proposal was. So there was a little misconception. And we weren't invited to the table to, with staff to have that conversation. And I think that's a little bit of short-sightedness. When they went and the three people who made that selection were rail rail consultants and the, the people who have um, skin in the game. So please reconsider that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for lining up. Uh, uh, good Hello, morning. Uh, Peter Stanger. Um, I live in South County and also I, I do like taking trains. I take the train to Colorado several times. Um, I do want to point out that um, the rail proposed rail operator uh, in what he put up there was mostly for recreational use. I didn't hear any um, uh, transportation use. In fact, I was a little surprised that the representatives from South County didn't say, well, you know, where do we get in our transportation to get the single cars off to Highway 1? That wasn't proposed. Um, earlier this week, I sent over to, the, um, to you all a story that came out of the Chronicle about the wine train. Uh, they were saying the usual fare for the wine train was two to three hundred dollars, and they, um, the workers on the wine train uh, were taking the bus back from Healdsburg uh, with um, uh, on a dollar fifty bus. Um, it gets back down to: Is this going to be recreational or is this going to be transportation? Because if it's going to be recreational, I really think a trail would be better. And a trail also gives us the opportunity to ride our bikes to work, which is something I did from La Selva to Santa Cruz for over five years myself. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Christine, and I've been here along with my family for over 40 years in Santa Cruz. Uh, I want to thank the Commission for taking the time to listen to uh, all the input regarding the selection of an operator for the rail line. Because of the limited time frame, I will touch on key points and questions. The two prior operators were freight railroads, both promising to fund upgrades to the line. Neither were able to achieve new freight opportunities on the branch line, and both ended their contract with RTC. Since Progressive Rail is a freight-only railroad, and because of limited freight prospects, are you concerned Progressive will be a repeat of past operator selections? <laughs> With all the congestion on the railroads, we look to passenger rail to provide relief. Yet Progressive is a short-line freight operator, not a passenger service provider. Isn't that counterintuitive to the goals of the RTC? Is it in the best interest of the RTC to select a rail service provider and lock into a contract with a provider prior to the completion of the United Corridor Study? Shouldn't the report precede the operator selection so that the goals are in alignment? If progressive is so progressive, then how come they have no women or minorities on their senior management team? <laughs> I'm a progressive community such as Santa Cruz, I would hope we practice what we preach. I, for one, support using our community businesses who have employed generations of county residents, pay local taxes to help many services we benefit from, and have been active in contributing to nonprofits in the area. I hope the RTC supports our local business too when considering the next operator. I appreciate. I appreciate the RTC for taking my comments into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Um, my name is Monique Kramer. Um, 
we like living here too. We like it better if we don't have to listen to train horns blowing at 100 decibels every, for 15 seconds at every intersection that can be heard for almost two miles. Um, I recognize that there are quiet zones. I urge everyone to look into that. The uh, smart train actually did a study on it, which we should have done. Um, and they say very clearly quiet zones are not quiet. Uh, anyway, the uh, Unified Corridor Investment Study has a certain number of goals they've laid out. And in pursuit of these goals, they're studying six scenarios using one assumes a comprehensive and exhausting methodology. Uh, exhaustive, excuse me. Fully half of those scenarios do not include a train as a regular use. I'm not saying they're necessarily pulling up the tracks, but they don't include a train. Scenarios A, C, and D. Uh, the UCIS is not scheduled to be complete until the winter of this year, so I would like it if someone can explain to me why the RTC is even considering entering negotiations with a rail operator. Why would the RTC commit our limited transportation energy and monies to a rail when study analyzing the best way to apply that energy and those monies has not been completed? Uh, it feels um, like there isn't a whole lot of, there's a lot of bias here. I'm hearing a lot of noise and, and tonality that says the train is what we're doing, the train is what's happening and we haven't finished a study which has purported to be um, designed to look at a number of different options. Uh, I don't feel as if there was timely information around this whole subject. Uh, looking back at the December 7th agenda, I didn't see anything about this in it, and I was at that meeting. Um, aside from the lack of timely information, the awarding of a contract to Progressive Rail undermines the promised open, transparent public process for determining the best uses of this rail corridor, which could result in a trail-only scenario or other non-rail decisions. Um, how can we do that if we've entered into a 10 or 20 year contract with all due respect to Progressive who has said that they would step away? I would be interested to see that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Leopold and fellow commissioners. My name is Mark Masidi Miller. I'm a professional civil engineer with more than three decades of experience designing public works infrastructure, and I've lived in this county for almost the same amount of time. <clears throat> I'm here today just to remind you that uh, we're not entering, entering, entering into a contract with Progressive Rail. We're simply evaluating the proposals received, selecting the most qualified response, and then authorizing your executive director to negotiate with that selected proposer uh, to negotiate a contract that we can find acceptable. Um, I would encourage you to go ahead and do that. Um, primarily, we've uh, uh, issued a letter that said, uh, gosh, uh, Iowa Pacific, we're going to fire you if, if you don't uh, come into compliance with the terms of your agreement. And Iowa Pacific wisely said, well, wait, before you fire us, resign. We resign. Um, we need a rail operator. You're the owners of a railroad. Uh, you're obligated by law uh, under the purchase agreement, under the Service Transportation Board, under who even knows how much, you're required to, to be a responsible operator. Uh, not having an operator of that rail line exposes the taxpayers of this county to liability. And uh, as a taxpayer of this county, I'm not okay with that. Uh, we need an operator. <clears throat> Progressive Rail is obviously a, a very responsive proposer. Uh, they have considerable expertise. I agree with the staff recommendation that they are by far the most qualified. I strongly recommend you uh, award uh, or uh, authorize your executive director to negotiate a contract that you would find acceptable, and let's move on. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Hi, this is Robert Stevens. Uh, I wanted to ask you a few questions very quickly, commissioners. Why is Metro having a hard time financially and all our roads are in the county are in need of repair? This one is easy. It's a lack of funding or are funds not wisely spent? Do you think your unified corridor study is fair and will provide clarity? Do you think this issue has divided our community? Um, I don't think so. I think your study will not be fair because your staff knows what they want. They want to train and that's why we have controversy. You must know your staff has bias. They say rail banking can't be done, Proposition 16 funds can't be returned, on and on. You, you and your staff, have you established any standard practices to make this study fair? Is there peer review? Are there outside experts brought in from other communities? Uh, are, are you, uh, do you have an oversight committee at all, a community committee on this? 
To me, the whole study seems like a sham. I don't see that you've achieved your job of making this fair. Now, let's just suppose the study came out and said no rail, passenger rail is possible for 20 years or never. Uh, and our community would be better off with just a trail. Why do you want a trail operator in place? Union Pacific sold the line because they could not make it work. Iowa Pacific failed and they owe us $60,000. Why do you think a new group of Midwesterners operating a tourist train on the North Coast will, is, will work or is anything our community wants? How does this solve any of our transportation problems? It does not. It will only create more traffic for locals. We want immediate and cost-effective solutions, not a train. You might hope for a train someday, and I might hope for an international airport at Watsonville, and Trump might hope for a wall, but none of these things are going to happen. Please act like leaders and lead. Don't hold on to a hope of a someday costly train that won't solve anything. We don't have the times or the funds. Thank you very much for Thank your you. time. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Anderson Shepard. Um, I'm a homeowner. I live in Live Oak, and my house is directly adjacent to the track. So I have skin in the game. I'll, I will admit that. But I'm also a proponent of sustainable, er, sustainable transportation planning. And I want to believe in the decisions that our, that you, that our decision makers are making uh, for the benefit of the community. Um, and just given the political contention of this affair and the timeline up on the board there and what's been discussed already, I think it's just a little disingenuous to be moving forward with signing or even discussing signing new contracts until after the Unified Corridor study is finished. Um, that study represents public transparency and a public process that I would like to respect, and I just think that rushing into um, discussion of future train contracts is premature. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Bud Colligan. I'm a resident of Live Oak, Mr. Leopold's district. I just want to point out uh, at a very top level that something is happening here. Uh, Greenway has garnered over 6,000 petition signers. We heard about 3,500, and we're on our way to 10,000 people that oppose the direction of this uh, commission. Many community groups, many city endorsements, and they're trying to tell you they don't like the current plan, period. We are organized, and we are not going away. Um, the new progressive proposal uh, is the third in six years. You remember Sierra Northern. Bruce brought it up. Um, then we had Iowa Pacific. Now we have our friends from Progressive. Their proposal is full of unrealistic projections. It demonstrates little understanding of our community. It requires a $3.2 million investment, certainly an underestimate, when we don't know the results of the UCIS. Mr. McKinsey didn't say who's paying for that. One of my mentors at Apple used to call that happy talk. And I'm sure you heard the same happy talk from Iowa Pacific. Is this a recipe for success? Mr. McKinsey, I want you to know that you will have strong opposition to any tourist train north of Watsonville. Commissioners, I urge you to focus on freight in Watsonville, which is our problem today. Contract for less than one year for freight only and objectively await results of the UCIS without tying our hands with a tourist train contract. This is the Regional Transportation Commission, not the Regional Tourist Commission. I thank you. Morning. Gail McNulty, Greenway. Thank God for Bud and Brian and all of the other independent citizens that are looking out for our community because we are quite literally getting railroaded. The public process is clearly broken. I would like to start by asking people who are here representing Greenway or Trail Now to raise your hands. 
Okay, now keep those hands up. And if there's anyone here who's advocating for any solution on the rail corridor that does not include rail, add your hands, please. Okay. Um, that, that's just a show, but I also I have a question that I hope you'll bring up with the gentleman from Progressive. One thing you will see as a small bullet point on page 28 of their proposal um, is that they the one the one outside company they are already looking to partner with is a company that's looking to locate to construct a propane distribution terminal in Watsonville. So Commissioner Rios and Commissioner um, Caput. Please, I ask you to protect your citizens. I happen to know that the people who advocated in your community just last year to keep oil tankers off of your street are not happy about this because this is not going to take trucks off the road. This is going to put trucks on the road. And these trucks are going to be full of compressed explosive gas. Okay, it's not a good thing for a community. Other communities are protesting this. Ask these gentlemen who's going to profit from that. I don't think it's anyone here locally, and it's not a major employer. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, and just in terms of transit, we need real transit solutions for our community. Um, while we're saving our options and minimizing our risks, kitchen workers across our county are working past midnight because they need to stay there until the dishes are done, and there is not a bus that they can catch at that point. So these are the people who need transit, and we are not currently serving them. These are people who need better buses that run later, and we need to think about that. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Patrick Wiesman. I am a resident of Ben Lomond and a supporter of the Friends and Rail Trail. I just wanted to raise a couple concerns uh, regarding the RTC staff selecting <laughs> Progressive Rail as their operator of the branch line. Um, first of all, I'm very impressed of their track record of restoration of rail and business operations, as well as their short-term plans for alternative transportation issues, particularly the uh, uh, Suntan Special, uh, the three-year plan for the Suntan Special. Um, some of the concerns that I have was the financial magnitude of moving to Santa Cruz County and uh, retrofitting old equipment to cleaner emissions and uh, modern standards as described in his plan. Um, uh, lack of business experience in this area, uh, plans for the special excursion market other than the suntan special which needs to be careful, carefully marketed for success. Um, um, overall stream of revenue from these uh, points above, uh, the immediate necess uh, necessity of funding and safety of quiet zones, uh, uh, trains will only be occasional and uh, during daytime hours, I, I presume at least in the initial years. Uh, and the request for a 20 year contract, that's a little bit, uh, yeah. Uh, anyways, we just, uh, in my opinion, excuse me, we need to uh, really ask ourselves why we need to make a risky play for a huge new operator when we already have a well-established operator in Santa Cruz County with assumably enough finances and resource to make it happen easier. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Josh Stevens here. I'm quite impressed with the turnout here. Having mentioned earlier, the coastal communities south of us decided to invest into the rails and going beyond the, and decided to go beyond the idea of the arrogant idea of keeping heavy fossil fuel vehicles on a single corridor, which is the goal of one of the operator proposals listed today. It's almost as if cleaning a small lane of metal and wood tied together is quicker to remove mud from than a two to eight lane highway. If it weren't for Amtrak availability, some coastal residents would be subject to four-hour commutes with these workarounds. My point to all this is it's dangerous to think that pedicabs, e-bikes, or what the trail-only groups uh, call Google Pods or people power will save us in a time of need. In fact, I wouldn't even trust the aforementioned operator with the Thomas the Tank Engine train set. And finally, I would like to ask that the RTC put the next Santa Cruz branch line rail operator, whoever it might be, through the ringer. The, rail, the community cannot put faith into a new railroad operator unless they're held accountable. 
Commissioners, if whoever you choose as the next operator has any hints of delinquency for payments, the default process needs to be expedited. The process for handling Iowa Pacific, their payroll and lack thereof was epsimal at best, and the community definitely expects better. As for operator of choice, I want to say that Progressive Rail knows how to put on a presentation. Um, I did have a couple of questions in regards to the trails they met, they shown in their presentation. Just, just curious as to how wide they are. Um, but they seem to be a solid operator, and um, as all else fails, I'd recommend our local p uh, people of Roaring Camp as everyone takes pride in local business. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Kerry Pico again. Um, I was at a meeting last night at Scotts Valley of which Fort claimed that we could build the commuter train with zero tax dollars, new tax dollars. It would be free. There would be a train to Pajaro. It's in the Capitol Corridor. I can tell you that the Capitol Corridor has dropped the train to Salinas, which includes Pajaro, off their agenda. It's no longer there for the last few meetings. So the point is, somehow statements don't get told that's true in the public. And now I'm going to get to the RTC, which I will not say not true. However, we all know, I shouldn't say we all know, their survey was extremely biased in my opinion, and I wrote an article on that. Their numbers in the feasibility study were clearly overestimated on ridership, underestimated on price, and everything's a little too rosy. The traffic is always misstated, and everybody that I'm telling about the six out of ten cars going up the night, uh, highway 17 are always surprised. The RTC people are surprised too, but that's what the data shows. They refused to enforce the contract with Iowa Pacific until it made it into the news article, uh, newspaper, the Sentinel. And I, I want to tell you, I'm the one who gave it to them and said, keep my name out of it. So I don't care. I believe in contracts, but you've got to enforce contracts exactly. So now, this is what I say. The RTC created controversy where none existed before. So how much, uh, who will pay for the repairs of the train tracks now, okay? How much will you, and I actually I'm really saying the RTC, will pay for your job because it's really in your interest to keep it going. And so who will pay for the uh, rail upgrades that aren't usable, that the class two that they're talking about? It's not usable for commuter rails, so who is it for? It's for supporting the newcomer, which I actually think is a really good presentation, but that's not our job is to pay for them. So the last thing is. Thank you. Um, I'd like Thank to say you. I lived in Wisconsin, and yeah. I, I think you guys give short shrift to the Midwest. It's a wonderful place to Thank live you. when you're out here. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Ashley Wynn. I live in La Selva Beach. Um, I've got a couple of comments on the, <coughs> the request for authorization to negotiate. First of all, the staff report um, at number seven when it requested proposals, asked for a proposer's most recent financial statements. What Progressive produced are financial statements based on EBITDA. That's not financial statements according to generally accepted accounting principles. First, require gap compliant financial statements. EBITDA makes companies with heavy asset balance sheets look healthier than they actually are. And this is from a Forbes magazine article recently. A beta portrays companies' debt service ability, but only some types of debts. A beta ignores working capital requirements. And there is more issues with a beta. So prior to authorizing negotiations, let's get real financial statements first. Second, because we're waiting for the corridor study to be completed, you should restrict, assuming you want to give them the authority to negotiate, you need to restrict the RTC negotiators in advance so that there is a clear escape clause from any long-term contract 
which uh, does not require a payment of RTC funds. Without that, I would like to respond that maybe this is consistent with Mr. Dondero's com comment that rail banking has never resulted in a return. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you. Good morning. Hello, Commissioners. My, um, <clears throat> my name is Stephen Slade. I'm the Executive Director of the Land Trust. We're your partner in building this trail. We have $6 million committed. And I have to admit, this agenda item seemed not to merit this level of response to me. Uh, the way I think we look at it is when Measure D was passed, when the Unified Corridor Study was started, we had a rail operator. That operator has failed, and you're replacing him them. Um, it does not seem to me, and it's clear, they're, they're not proposing mass commuter transit. It's a segue proposition to get us to that point if we ever get to that point. So it seems to me, and we encourage you to, you know, adopt the staff recommendation and proceed to do what I think is a relatively routine thing. The other thing I also want to say, I'm really tired of hearing your trash staff, uh, trashed your staff trashed by people. They're accused of bias, they're accused of malfeasance, they're accused of all sorts of things. We have been working with them for several years closely. We've been paying bills. And our experience is that the staff is, is, is experienced, one, which all the other, quote, experts you've been hearing from today aren't. And secondly, they are committed to your goal which is to provide transportation for the many, not for the few. And I cannot get over thinking that a two-lane super bike highway will serve a few. And uh, that's why we support you continuing to look at these options and continuing to study. And it seems like every meeting face another challenge to something you've been unanimously supporting for years. We encourage you to stay the course. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the reminder about uh, the civility of any uh, public discourse. I think that's us useful, and I encourage everyone to, re to remember that as they speak. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Glenn Hanna. I live in Pleasure Point. Uh, I think it's inappropriate and incorrect at the moment to proceed with selecting, a, for, on a 20-year lease, a new rail operator uh, while we haven't uh, completed the Unified uh, Carter study. Uh, I would also suggest that there is no penalty for us to wait three or four or six months. We can find an interim freight operator. And I would like to amplify what the previous spoke, uh, speaker said about the financial condition of uh, Progressive. If you look on page uh, 15 of their financials, the current ratio which is the difference between their current assets and their current liabilities has deteriorated significantly in the past uh, year. It used to be $4.2 million. It has now declined to $1.7 million. That's a, that's a measure of their ability to sustain fluctuations in their financial conditions. It is at a low. I would then turn the page uh, and ask you to look at page uh, 16 of their presentation. And in the calculations of EBIT, you're allowed to deduct certain items. There are two items that raise interesting questions, and I think you might want to ask Mr. McKenzie what they are. The first one is, quote, staff short-term incentive uh, payments. That's $2.5 million. That's in a uh, year-to-date to October, that's in eight months. And the second one is employment termination related expenses, a quarter of a million dollars. These seem to be rather substantial one time. Uh, and I think you might want to look at them. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Um, Scott Roseman, uh, I live in Live Oak. <clears throat> um, some of the rail, uh, rail plus trail people don't care about bikes. They, they just want to, to uh, preserve the rail 
uh, corridor, hoping that one day we'll have a train. Uh, most, however, do want a bike trail also. And some of the Greenway folks don't care about solving the transportation issues. The, the folks in Watsonville, et cetera, they, they just want to have their nice little bike trail. <clears throat> most, however, do care about how we need to solve the transportation issues. In, uh, Unclog Highway 1 provides solutions for the folks in South County. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, most of the folks on both sides want a bike trail and want to solve the transportation issue woes, the transportation woes of this county. <clears throat> it's just that we have some different approaches to how to solve this, and this has led us to this great divisiveness, this great polarization so that people have formed into camps, into size, into adversarial relationships. <clears throat> and where is this all going to lead? If one side appears to prevail, the other side will gather up all its armor and weaponry and continue to fight until they have defeated the enemy and all the rest of us will still be without a bike trail and without a solution to solve the transportation issues. You all know that. So I'm asking you to not add to this divisiveness and to wait on deciding about freight service until the UCS is complete as you are saying to all of those who are lobbying you on both sides of this, that you are all waiting for the UCS to decide how to proceed, be consistent, and don't box yourselves in. <clears throat> Moreover, as I have discussed with some of you directly, and I've talked about this with other people, let's get leaders of Fort and Greenway who both want a trail and who both want to solve the transportation issue together in a room with one or two of you neutral folks and perhaps a mediator and let us hammer out Thank a you. compromise together. Let me just, I just, I'm just almost done. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, uh, I, I, I it allows wanna, I us wanna, to uh, stop uh, this war. Um, you know, we've, we've got uh, major uh, issues Mr. to Mr. Rosen, I, you, I don't want to turn off the mic. I'm trying to honor what everybody else had the same amount of time. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Manu Koenig. What an incredible opportunity we have before us. But with Iowa Pacific abandoning their lease, we have the opportunity to do something new. We will potentially save millions of dollars from having to break a lease. We can collect new information about ways to use this corridor. What will we learn by immediately diving into a new contract with a new operator that basically proposes to use the corridor in exactly the same way as the previous operator? How is this operator different? Thank you, uh, Commissioner McPherson, for basically beginning that line of questioning, but I think that needs to be teased out a lot more. <laughs> what will we learn that's new with this, with this operator that we haven't already learned? The, uh, <laughs> the currents are very much anti-rail uh, in general. I mean, if you've heard anything about the self-driving trucks that are now moving from Texas to California, moving freight, um, they anticipate that that will be much cheaper than freight service uh, on rail line in the future. Um, we've helped, as I, I've personally helped to collect more than 6,000 signatures in favor of Greenway. I was in the Rio Del Mar neighborhood yesterday. I have to tell you, no one in that neighborhood wants a train. Um, we have the opportunity now, with the abandonment of the lease, um, to test new things. How many people will turn out to use the corridor on a weekend? for recreation for our local residents. That is a huge information point that we can understand just the viability or the demand for a trail only option. So stay committed to gathering information. Uh, don't be paper pushers. None of you were elected to be paper pushers and we all know that you're a lot better than that. Um, take a stand for information. If you, if you wanna know about the political viability of trains, um, consider that the Measure D sign doesn't have a train on it. No, it's a very small minority of the population probably actually voted for Measure D because of the idea of a train. So stay committed to information, and let's think of some lean experiments that we can do uh, to show the demand for this trail-only option. Just get the information. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Nels Westman. I'm a resident of Capitola. Last Thursday night, I attended a Capitola City Council meeting during which the pros and cons of rail trail versus rail only were presented. It was clear that trail only is much more popular in Capitola than rail trail. 
I think it clearly illustrates the RTC staff's cynical public statements that because Measure D passed, then a strong majority of county residents support the RTC's expensive, ill-conceived, and underperforming plan to operate a railroad in our uh, passenger railroad in our county. Although I would have preferred our council take a stronger stand, I do appreciate their position that with an $850,000 committed to the UCS, the most responsible thing for them to do is to wait until the study becomes available later this year before making a p taking a position. In this new era of transparency, that does seem to be the responsible thing to do. At the extreme opposite end of the transparency scale is today's staff proposal to, instead of waiting for the UCS, that the RTC should sign yet another contract to operate trains again on the dilapidated tracks for the next 10 or 20 years and to spend over $3 million making more patchwork repairs. Clearly by obligating some boutique railroad company to send the occasional locomotive up and down the old tracks for the next 20 years and by throwing millions of dollars down a patch em up rat hole, the, st the staff's blatant pro-railroad bias is on full display. I urge the members of this commission to reject the cynical attempt to make the UCS irrelevant. In the name of transparency, fairness, and good governance, do not enter into long-term railroad contracts and spend millions on these old tracks until the results of the UCS are known in a few months. At that point, a much more informed debate can and will take place. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Pierre Cannon from Ecology Action. Ecology Action would like to support the staff work um, to stay in compliance with regulations as the RTC is the owner of the Coastal Rail Corridor. We recommend that any contract that you enter into in is short term and that it gives the flexibility to the RTC to retain control and steer the corridor use to prioritize sustainable transportation modes. We also ask you that you address the concerns about how this might undermine or impact the Unified Corridor Study, which is taking place right now and due to be completed by the end of the year. The Coastal Rail Corridor potential is to provide viable, sustainable transportation options for residents and visitors stuck in worsening traffic. Vehicle travel contributes to some 50% of local greenhouse gas emissions, providing low or no carbon transportation alternatives that are affordable, convenient, safe, and healthy is the ultimate goal of the public corridor. Thank you for your work in managing this corridor and your consideration. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Elwick, before you speak, I just want to get a sense of how many more speakers we have. Raise your hand if you want to speak. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If, if everybody can get in line, that would be great. Uh, uh, I only saw five hands go up. So you want to put them up one more time? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, now I see nine hands going up. I'm just, I'm just trying to get a sense uh, for commissioners. Please go on. Mr. Okay. Good, good morning. My name is Paul Ellerick. I'm an Aptos resident. I've uh, been following this issue very closely. I supported Measure D strongly for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of them is that we need transit. I'm really uh, amazed is the wrong word, but I heard a lot of people talk against the rail today, but you know, I don't hear anybody saying that we need transit. We want to see, you know, a bicycle path, a walking path, and all that's cool. That's all cool. But we need transit for South County. Uh, we need workers to be able to get from South County to Santa Cruz. And let's not cloud the issue with that called transit, uh, recreational rail, uh, a bad thing. It's you know, it's going to bring some money and, and uh, they're going to leave their cars home or in a parking lot someplace and spend their money here. So let's let's keep transit in mind. You know, I, I voted for, for Measure D for everything that was in it. There was, uh, in fact, Measure D hadn't it mentioned rail and it, it's good, it's good. So that's why I voted for it and that's why many of my neighbors voted for it. And without their vote, it never would have passed and we wouldn't be here arguing about it right now. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. Hi, good morning again. Uh, I'm Dr. Hartley. Uh, I've gone bio bioenergy. You might want to get closer to the microphone. Uh, sorry. I've gone bioenergy. Um, I just want to point out that 
CARB, the California Air Resources Board, strongly supports rail transportation. And so far, they've allocated $574 million to the transit and intercity rail capital project, of which $193 million got allocated last year. So those funding should be available to any rail projects in this county. And also in lo low carbon transit operations program, 231 million went to disadvantaged communities and lots of those are disadvantaged community. So those funds are available uh, and I hope the commission will look into it a bit more. I didn't see any mention in the report. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. It is just morning. Um, I'm Bruce Sawhill, Friends of the Rail and Trail. Um, I understand that you're convened here to fulfill your federal obligations, and uh, I trust that you'll choose a good operator and that you'll make an appropriately flexible contract. Fort has advocated for rail and trail for over a decade and will continue to do so. I've often written and spoken for the case of light, clean, efficient electric passenger rail for our county. But I'm not here to do that today. Nobody speaks up for freight rail. The other day I needed to sleep, so I was reading the California Department of Food and Agriculture's crop reports. I found that Santa Cruz County grew $637 million in agricultural products in 2016. That's a lot of lettuce. The report also indicated that this was in excess of 200,000 tons of output. A fully loaded semi-truck can carry 40 tons, so one would need over 5,000 of them to move this load to market. That will pulverize our roads. But several dozen freight trains can haul all of this load before lunch without breaking a sweat. That's what rail does, three times as efficiently as trucks. Build a freight transshipment business here. It's good for business and good for the environment. And to remind you about the case of taking the long view, some of you will remember the California Transportation Commission meeting in Sacramento in 2011, where the California Transportation Commission voted to disperse their funds the RTC so they could buy the line. And here's a reminder of that day. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Barry Scott, Rio Del Mar. Um, you know, I, I want to say that the replacing Iowa Pacific with the carrier, entering entering negotiations does not impact the integrity of the Unified Corridor Study, I'm certain. It, you know, you wouldn't be allowed to do that. Um, what it does is, is, is retain contracts, keep us in compliance with existing grants and loans and prior, prior funding streams, and it's just the, seems to me the, the natural thing to do to look for a carrier and negotiate. So I, I urge you to, to uh, you know, support that, that process. Um, you know, the public opinion part of your role, I mean, and I want to say I am so impressed. I follow your work. You have such a, a heavy, heavy responsibility to the future, to the present, with uh, such, you know, un un unchangeable decisions that you may make, and you have these uh, different groups and different, different points of view. You've got to, and I know you do, keep in perspective how much weight to give public comment. Uh, last night in, in uh, Scotts Valley, after a December 20th, presentation, exclusive presentation by Greenway to the Scotts Valley Council, they passed a resolution that seems to have been written by Greenway, um, three to two. We complained, and they were good enough to give us a time to speak, and last night, uh, Mark Masidi Miller addressed the uh, council, and uh, Council Member Dillis made a motion to reconsider after hearing both sides, which was the right way to do it. Uh, Capitoli did that, we heard both sides, and they decided not to interfere with the process. So as you move forward, um, carry on with your impressive work of looking at the facts, thinking of the future, looking at things like actual reports from smart train successes, the 2018 state rail plan, um, and, and do your best. Keep doing your best. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Morning. It still is morning. Uh, David Giannini, Santa Cruz resident. I want to read to you a note from a friend of mine, Dean Cutter, who's a science teacher at New Brighton Middle School. He says, I thought I'd share with you an experience that I had with my seventh grade science students at New Brighton Middle School. Every day I pose a question on the projector to kids to consider as they file into the room. 
I use this time to take role, etc., and there is no prompting on my part. A few days ago, I put up these questions. Number one, do you ever walk on the Capitola Railroad trestle? And two, if the trestle were fixed up to be a legal safe path, if you could bike or walk on, would you use that path? I have about 140 students. About 50% said they use the trestle sometimes in its present dangerous state. About 90% said they would use it if it were legal and safe to do so. Although this is only an informal study, an informal survey, I thought you would be interested. I want to point out that I avoid taking political stands with my students and I was only seeking specific information to share with you. I'd also like to share with you a, this morning, a, um, oops, there we are, <laughs> some statistics from a survey that was conducted by Bicycling Magazine. 54% of the adults in the U.S. perceive bicycling as a convenient way to get from one point to another. And 51% would love to ride a bike more often. However, 53% worry about being hit by a car, and 47% say they would be more likely to ride a bicycle if motor vehicles and bicycles were physically separated. Physically separating cars and bikes is a great for cyclists. Physically separating pedestrians and cyclists is great for pedestrians. No one likes to be the slow mover and be run over by something bigger and faster. I urge you to look at protected bike lanes and separating bicycle traffic from pedestrian traffic whenever possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. I Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Bill Cook. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz for 40 years. My name is Bill Cook. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz for 40 years. Um, I'm here today to ask that any use of our rail corridor for anything other than freight service in the immediate Watsonville area be delayed indefinitely. Our 22 or so trestles and overcrossings were constructed long before anyone ever thought to engineer for seismicity. Um, Anybody that was uh, around here in 1989 knows what that's like. We lost a great deal of infrastructure. And a, a good deal of damage were, was done to those trestles. And it's been, uh, it's been studied and they can be fixed. But the thing that uh, is my concern is that uh, while we can engineer uh, the trestles, repair them, replace them, uh, we can't make a train stay on top of them in the event of a seismic event. It's not going to happen. <coughs> I consider it to be irresponsible to consider passenger service in the location where our corridor is now. Uh, it's only a matter of, of time before something like that happens. Uh, when, the, when the corridor was originally created, uh, nobody lived here. <laughs> We were just extracting the, uh, the natural wonder that uh, was once here in greater abundance else to go elsewhere. And uh, the, the train worked really good for that. And, uh, and uh, thankfully, we still have the remains that are quite lovely to, to live amongst. <laughs> so um, that's my primary concern. Um, let's not uh, bust up the process by uh, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Buzz Anderson. I'm an advocate for Greenway, and I might add I'm also an advocate for improved bus service. Um, I have an email here from Ron Marquez, and uh, Ron Marquez was the former director of the RTC in the 80s. And he sent this email to the commission here, but unfortunately it didn't get in on time, so I'm gonna just read his first paragraph. Dear commissioners, 
the proposed train contract does nothing to reduce congestion in santa cruz county in fact new transportation and parking demands will be generated by the programs proposed in the recommended contract the environmental effects of these demands has not yet been evaluated i too ask that the commission wait until the uci uh, study is completed until decisions are made thank you thank you Before you begin, can I just get a show of hands of how many of, of speakers we have remaining? I see two. So the gentleman in the blue shirt will be the last speaker. Good morning. My name is Dan Dion. I'm a Santa Cruz resident, and I want to reiterate all the reasons you've heard why we should keep the rail corridor open for mass transit options in the future, but wanted to let you know that I support it, and I encourage you to negotiate a contract that keeps us flexible. We have a lot to work out but that gets us some data that we can use in the study that's coming out next fall. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, members of the commission. Um, I want to invite you all to one of these days, weekday, weekend, to catch the 615 bus from Santa Cruz right in front of uh, parking lot 10, you can catch it right there at 615, the very first one, and ride it all the way down to Watsonville. There was a time when I first came here to Santa Cruz, I couldn't find a, a good job, um, even with my education, my massive experience in community service. So I took little jobs until I finally got a really <coughs> nice, decent job down on Park Boulevard, Park Avenue, at Bay Photo Labs, their old labs. But to get there at 7 in the morning, I had to get my bike, ride that bus to Park Avenue. Then I'd ride it back home. I want you to see how many people fill up that bus the very first route in the morning going to Watsonville. They're all workers who likely live in Beach Flats. I want you to <coughs> take the time to figure out how much time it gets it takes for them to get from Santa Cruz, California, Beach Flats, down to Watsonville, and then back to Santa Cruz. Now, these are people who work hard, and much later on, I was uh, blessed to get a job with parking control. What I loved best about that was I had the beach area and Beach Flats. It requires a permit, and I love giving tickets for tourists who took the parking spots of those hard workers who'd go out to work even on weekends. So I want you to think about the people who do work and need to go down to South County to work and come back or vice versa. Thank, Thank you. you. Our last speaker. Thank you. All right. I'm Ryan Sarantaro from Live Oak. I think from Progressive's point of view, what they've got is two different um, opportunities here. One of them is a uh, freight out of Watsonville where they could very well build a, a, a positive and, uh, and strong business. And the other is the tar baby of trying to somehow comply with the concept that there's actually a viable rail corridor from Santa Cruz to San Jose. I think that the Regional Transportation Commission needs to come step up to the plate and bring some public bring the public along in terms of trust because right now there's a tremendous distrust when the staff is constantly saying things that are actually not factually true in terms of rail banking in terms of uh, <laughs> what how people m voted for measure d and what you need to do in this case is you have a study that's out there that's going to come in by the end of the year Please take the opportunity that has been provided by the fact that this the current operator has dropped out. Deal with rail service if you need to out of Watsonville. That sounds like a great opportunity, but leave the, the trail and the rail itself alone. Don't spend millions of dollars trying to upgrade for a, a, uh, a service that is not going to serve our community. Thank you. Thank you. So we've heard from a number of members of the public. Um, 
uh, I uh, thank everybody for their comments. Uh, now I'll return it to our commission uh, for action. Uh, Commissioner Rockin. For comments, I said. Oh, com comments, yeah. yeah. Then action. <coughs> then action. Um, I have a motorcycle, but I don't own a car. Yesterday and every week, I take my bicycle down to the metro station, take the 17 to the um, Caltrain, take the Caltrain to the BART, and walk the last two blocks to where I'm a chief negotiator for some workers in, in San Francisco. Um, so I, I believe in bicycles. I believe in public transit. I'm not much of a fan of the car. People have said <coughs> in the audience, I think many of them, that, you know, Will, will we ever have a rail? It's speculative, as the last speaker described as a tar baby, um, attracts, you know, uselessly attracts things. Um, the reality is, and I think people have to, and, and I don't need to see a study on rail banking to know, given the reaction to right now of people who say, tear that track out, what would happen if you had a trail with no rail, didn't preserve a public transportation corridor there, and at the end of that process, 20 years from now, we decide we need to have a bus route along there, for example. Because the problem with it, you can put a, pour a million more, 10 million more dollars in buses, they're not going to get to Watsonville any faster because they're stuck in the same traffic with everybody else on Highway 1. So we need to preserve that corridor for public transit, not just as a recreational amenity. And I, of course, so also support it as a recreational amenity. I will be one of the people that rides his bicycle to Capitola and stuff. But that's, you can't expect that to be a mass phenomenon. And so whether we ever have a train or not in the future, keeping the, tra the rail there for me is a way of preserving it as a public transportation possibility. This commission has, a, I believe, a legal obligation to have some kind of uh, uh, transit uh, service on that, to rail service on that, on that corridor in order to not have to pay back the $20 million we spent, plus more, but the main 20 million bucks we spent to buy the corridor. And I was not just an alternate, but a member of the commission back when we made that decision. And I think it's really kind of critical that we just, as a number of speakers said, not think about a, a relationship with a rail operator because, you know, we're foregoing the decision about whether, when and where we might have rail or not have rail. I'm not sure we will have rail on that quarter, but so we're going to, I think we have to look to the future. There's going to be some kind of public transit on that quarter. And I think if you build a, a trail only plan, you'll never have public transit on that quarter. And it would be a real mistake to do so. Um, the um, land trust position that basically we're, this is not a big decision that has to do with either doing or not doing completely the, uh, the study of the, the quarter and its uses, but it's basically meeting our legal obligation to get another operator in there as an interim solution to things. I'm going to assume the people negotiating with them are going to work on the issues of what escape clauses, that's one thing you negotiate in a contract. What are the escape clauses and what kinds of conditions allow you out of it if it turns out not to be what you wanted in the end? I assume they'll ask the hard financial questions that a number of speakers spoke to. If the, if the financial data we have so far is not accurate, get some more. I'm sure they'll do that. They're competent people. I trust their ability to do it. I don't need to make a motion to direct them to do that. That's the job of negotiating a contract with people. So I'm hoping, I, I'm not going to make the motion, but I'm hoping that we have a motion here that basically says, let's uh, authorize our staff to negotiate with th these folks. Even the people that don't like the rail admitted they did a great presentation, not just that it was a, a well-facilitated presentation, but they made important arguments about what's possible here with rail. And I think we need to look at that seriously. If, in fact, you can't have a train uh, that doesn't that blow a horn that you're two miles away that's at 100 decibels, then maybe we're not going to have that service on our rail. We'll have to look at those kinds of questions. But I, the idea of this is a, uh, an idea to kill any possibility of keeping the rail there by right now not having an operator come in, lose the rail operation, require us to pay back $20 million because that's our legal obligation to the folks that funded us from the uh, state commission. That would be a big mistake. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Schifrin. Well, I agree with many things that Commissioner Rodkin says um, and have been a supporter of maintaining the rail line for the long view. I do think the commission today is faced with a dilemma. Uh, we have made a commitment to take the unified corridor study seriously. And I think that there are some implications of that. 
And unfortunately, we're also faced with having lost uh, the, maybe not so unfortunately, the operator of uh, the, the, the company with the contract to run rail operations. But um, so we're now having to decide whether, what to do about a new, uh, you know, whether to move forward with a new operator. Our current policy, as Mike indicates, uh, is to move is to pro continue to provide rail service. I think we also have legal obligations to do that, but I think we also have a commitment to uh, really take the unified corridors uh, study seriously. I think for myself, there's a compromise here that uh, allows the staff to move forward with negotiations with, uh, I, I would support Progressive Rail. I think they're, uh, I've been convinced, uh, and I thought their presentation was very good, that they, uh, they offer the best uh, option. Uh, but I think there is a way to move forward with um, the, the negotiation without making a final decision on uh, a, a new contract until we have a decision on the Unified Corridor Study. And I don't think this, while it looks like it might be out of whack with the uh, timeline that the, that the uh, Progressive Rail presented, I'm not sure it's that out of whack because that timeline really depended on making improvements to the line um, in response to the storm damage. And it's going to take some time to do that. We have the other item that comes after this um, that hires the engineering firm to look into that. Those uh, will mostly be paid for by FEMA because they are uh, part of the storm damage. But it will take time to do that. And in fact, it won't be possible to move uh, any kind of service uh, above Watsonville, if even in Watsonville, until those, uh, until those uh, improvements are made. And I don't think the uh, progressive, uh, if I understood their proposal, I don't think they were going to really making a, make a major commitment uh, until uh, in, until those improvements were done, as uh, because they can't really run the service. So I think what what I would recommend, and I'm prepared to make a motion if it's uh, it's acceptable to the committee, is that we select Progressive Rail as the preferred entity potentially to operate rail service on the Santa Cruz line for the purposes of negotiating a draft operating agreement. And secondly, that we authorize the executive director to negotiate a draft agreement with Progressive Rail and return to the RTC for consideration of the uh, negotiated agreement with the understanding that the, RCT, the RTC will consider final adoption of the agreement after the unified corridor study is completed and acted upon. So if it's acceptable, I'd make that as a motion. The motion by Schifrin. I'll second that. Seconded by Botteroff. Um, I think uh, Commissioner Botteroff wanted to uh, make some comments. Then I saw uh, uh, <coughs> Commissioner McPherson, Caput, Friend, and Johnson. I'll get over my mess up. <laughs> Great. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for their comments. And I think that we should all thank ourselves for the fact that we passed Measure D. Don't ever want to forget that because without that, we would not be having these discussions. And someone brought up today about, you know, a, a comment about Measure D and, you know, if the train was in there, I wouldn't have voted for it. I think everybody should understand that if every component of what Measure D was going to do for this county wasn't in there, it would not have passed. If the people didn't believe that there was at least a viability or an option for a train, it wouldn't have passed, which means we wouldn't be entitled to all the possible revenue we're going to have that we're going to contribute to ourselves, but maybe as being a self-help county from, from the feds and other entities. <clears throat> With that, the next best thing this commission did was years ago was buying that right away. We all know that. I mean, we don't know what it's going to what it's going to be its best use. I don't know that. What I heard today was lots of passion, lots of speculation. What we do know is we have a unified corridor study, which I believe in. I don't believe it's biased. I believe it's going to give us some concrete evidence about what we can make a good decision on. And the fact that uh, we lost Iowa Pacific, I kind of think that's a great thing. And the fact that we've got a company that's coming in here that believes in themselves, believes in this county, is another good thing. Not making any decisions about what's best for the county because I am going to wait for that study. And that's why I support Commissioner Schifrin's uh, motion and, and recommendation was because we're going to enter into negotiations. 
And that's what we need to do. We need to negotiate with an operator because I can't leave people that are going to have freight service in Watsonville high and dry with no freight service. All kinds of legal, uh, like Commissioner Rockton represented, all kinds of obligations, I believe, happen there. So, and for me, I sit here as a Metro representative. One of the things that's on the table and the options in the Unified Quarter Study is the potential of bus rapid transit. Not a lot of people brought that up today. I am open to every possible use, the best use of that trail. But in the meantime, negotiating with somebody who's interested in this county that thinks they can deliver a service, they think they can make money, then that's a great thing because that means that we're not going to be paying to support them. So those are my comments. I'm glad I seconded the motion. I look forward to voting on the motion. Uh, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I have a question about the the liability. I mean, I'm uncertain about just how liable are we for uh, the lack of improvements or repairs that uh, Iowa Pacific has made, and how I, I'm not. I, I I think the the phrase of the the motion is as good as you're going to get, but I'm still um, nervous about it, and. Um, I just I, I don't have clarity on our liability under where we are today without an operator there and without a contract with somebody else to do it. I, that's a big issue for me. I just don't um, um, if we I mean so I mean if we waited until the fall until we get this unified this study the, the corridor study um, how, how much out there are we how much out in the limb are we I'm um, I, I, you don't I want just to ask your attorney that in a public meeting. How, yeah. how eligible would we be sued successfully? Yeah, I, yeah, I know. Well, but I mean, maybe maybe uh, our executive director can make some comment. I'm going to limit my comment. Yeah, I can understand that. that. Yeah. But, um, you know, ultimately under um, Surface Transportation Board rules, if our operator fails or leaves, we're on the hook to continue providing freight service. Still have some customers on the line. It's not a huge volume, but there are there is business out there, and we don't know when the next time they're going to need service. So, if we aren't physically operate railroad operators with Vermont, then it seems incumbent on us to have somebody out there, <coughs> or we have to tangle with the federal regulatory agency. <coughs> That's as far as I want to go yeah, with I that, but but I would say we, we are responsible to provide that service. Um, so, uh, Supervisor Caput and friends, Commissioner uh, Johnson, Commissioner Bertrand, Commissioner Rios, and Commissioner Brown. I'll make mine quick. Um, if we only have, we're having a discussion about trail only. Uh, and that would not be possible if we didn't buy the railroad uh, mm -hmm. line uh, about seven years ago. So everybody who is for trail only should be thankful for the people that are uh, that were for purchasing the rail line in the beginning. Otherwise, uh, this whole thing would not be taking place. I think they are a package. I think they can go together. Um, I think when we purchased the rail line, we were, u were using taxpayers' money. And now we're obligated to have some kind of a rail line there. If, if we now say, well, yeah, we bought the railroad with your taxpayer money, but we're not going to even consider the railroad, we're only going to consider a trail only, somehow that, uh, that is not right. Um, the only concern I do have is What's the rush here? Why are we deciding right now before we know liability, before we have some more answers? <coughs> it, are, are they going to pull out uh, if we wait a couple of weeks until we clarify some things? I know you gave a, um, an answer on liability, and, uh, and that's great, but I'd, I'd like to hear from county council. A report from them and all that too. Yeah, we can come yeah. back to you with that information. Yeah. Yeah, but I didn't hear that at the uh, public hearing right now. Well, so no that's the only uh, that's the only opposition I have to it. It's uh, I think we need to clarify a few things until we actually vote on doing it right now. Well, uh, just to clarify the motion, it's not to really do anything but direct staff to negotiate. Those issues will be um, 
talked about and the commission will hear about them as a result of the negotiation process so it's no decision is being made on any of these issues in fact we haven't even defined all the issues even most of them that be that is what's going to come out of the negotiation process and all we're doing is initiating that process look and let me clarify it then we're not actually voting to select progressive rail right now let, so let me read over the, okay. that part of the motion it's right. to select progressive rail as the preferred entity potentially to okay. operate the rail service for the purposes of negotiating a draft agreement so we're just saying negotiate with them as opposed to the other uh, any of the other uh, proponents uh, or people who submitted a proposal and um, come back with a draft agreement and maybe along the way there'll probably be discussion with the commission okay, as well. If, that, if that's a wording then we're, we're in pretty good shape because it says here select progressive yeah, rail yeah, to was, operate. That was a recommended, he, he's, right. he submitted a, a separate, uh, uh, separate motion. But it doesn't say to operate. No, it's potentially to operate. Potentially. Yeah. Okay, that's well. I'm going by the wording in front of me here. I made a right. separate okay, motion. Okay, fine. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I do have a point of clarification on this, which is, uh, it seems that there is uh, an understanding that we have a legal mandate to provide freight service, the at a minimum. It doesn't seem that the motion, um, since it's initiating a negotiation, necessarily clarifies that freight service would be a part of said negotiation. I, I disagree slightly with my colleague, Commissioner Rockin. I think that, that the motion should include some set of parameters. I understand that, that there's um, specifics are, are done in a, in a different form than this, but I think that in the open form, it's still reasonable within a motion to <laughs> express to the community what parameters you would want uh, this to be done under. I think if the intention of the commission is that the negotiation would at least have freight service, that should be uh, stated, and that wasn't clear based on uh, the motion. Otherwise, uh, we're in a situation where we're acknowledging that we're running afoul of, of, of uh, legal mandate that the, that the commission's already acknowledged that we have to provide uh, freight service. So I was just asking for some clarification on the motion in that regard. I guess uh, from my perspective, by authorizing the staff to negotiate uh, a potential agreement, a draft agreement, it assumes that the staff is going to, you know, we're going to have, it, have an agreement that retains our legal, um, you know, uh, the, the commission acting in a, a legally correct way. So uh, rather than try to get into the legalities here, um, I, th I thought it would be better to just have sort of a general direction to move forward and um, if there are legal issues, we should probably talk about them in closed session. Agreed. But part two of your motion says to bring back a final contract after UCIS, which is functionally a year from now, which would mean that we wouldn't have an operator for the next 10 to 12 months providing a legally mandated freight service. That's my concern on the motion is that it, it, it seems to uh, not provide clarity on what we understand to be a legal mandate right now. Well, I'm not sure. And it may make sense to get more clarity in closed session about what that legal ma uh, legal mandate requires in terms of if we're negotiating an agreement and uh, working on correcting storm damage on the line, uh, do we have a liability because uh, we're not able to provide I freight service? Um, I, I you know, I think that the, in a sense those are legal questions and I'd rather sort of talk about them I just think it's important in terms of the public process to try as much as possible if we legally can and if we learn in closed session that we can't do this, it should come back to us, I would say. But we've made a commitment to really take the Unified Corridor Study <coughs> seriously. Um, I think that I can we do that and um, I think it, that while um, it may be necessary to provide for some interim service uh, without providing long-term service in terms of our, uh, our, uh, our liability. <coughs> I think as a, as a policy position, we should try to withhold the final decision on uh, uh, rail operator until we have the unified corridor uh, study decided. 
So then, that, then that's to me that I appreciate that clarification. But I just want the community to take away be, that because I think people, there will be an assumption that any activity to even engage, uh, negotiate a contract means that the, the commission has made a decision about the long-term disposition of the line, and that's not true. So what I want people to get that the action then that's being proposed today is to honor the UCIS by not initiating any long-term decision until after the UCIS is decided but in the short term to work on a negotiations of what a contract could look like with uh, this potential operator to both meet our mandates and, and, and any other components that may come post UCIS. And I think that that's a, as a I don't know that that, that that would be the general takeaway based on a number of the community comments that came up today was don't initiate any discussion there because it, it means that you're making a long-term disposition and the, and the motion doesn't say that. And I just wanted to make sure that that was understood with the community. I wonder if it would be helpful to add a um, provision to the motion that the uh, commission um, directs staff to return, if necessary, with um, any legally required short-term actions to uh, eliminate uh, any liability that the commission would have, if that's okay with this. I would accept that second and appreciate that. So there, uh, uh, an amendment has been made to the uh, to the motion, or an addition to the to the motion, and the seconder had, uh, has uh, agreed to that, um, and that would be an inclusion of potentially coming back if there are legally required uh, issues that we have to deal with interim be, in the interim. Um, so then we have uh, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. I think today we heard a lot uh, on both sides. Uh, it's a complicated issue. I think the whole matter of trust, though, was really one of the underlying subtexts that uh, was uh, discussed here. Um, and you know, I don't, I don't mean to quarrel with uh, the person from the Santa Cruz Land Trust uh, about you know, we we shouldn't do this with the staff. We shouldn't do that with staff. Um, it's out there a little bit in terms of the bias that I think some people feel that uh, is exhibited. And I was a little bit disappointed at the very start um, when the executive director talked about and essentially gave an editorial about this subject that sounded a little biased. And, th and when the whole idea of not honoring the results of, for example, the, the uh, tr uh, train feasibility study, okay, that was done at hundreds of thousands, a uh, cost of hundreds of thousands. It came out. Everybody kind of jumped on it in terms of uh, for their own purposes. Um, so I'm not going to get into the, the, the pluses and minuses of that. But I think credibility is important. And um, I, I would want, you know, if we're going to uh, proceed with giving direction to the executive director with the responsibility of exercising and, and, and uh, trying to get a, a good deal and and um, you know moving forward with uh, contracts um, that we have full faith. I would want him to get the best deal for this commission and for the people out there, because what I heard today were lots of things like uh, we don't trust the commission, uh, we have doubts about this, we're jumping uh, too far ahead. Feels quote feels like a lot of bias. It's a rush job. Um, questions about the financial um, statements given by, by Progressive. Um, it gives me no pleasure to, to, to kind of point out uh, maybe negatives about uh, either staff or Progressive or whatever. I'm sure they're a fine company. I think uh, m maybe the, me maybe the uh, motion uh, deals with the whole idea of jumping ahead before, excuse me, before a study is done. Um, to do otherwise would be, in, in my mind, the equivalent of a, of a bureaucratic imperial fiat, in which <coughs> the bureaucrats and uh, we, we, we don't even honor uh, what the original intentions were, and we're just going to go ahead. Because if you go with a 10 or 20 year uh, commitment, what you're doing is really a slap in the face to a community that is really undecided. We're not decided on this. Uh, you know. We have, you know, we have a responsibility to represent the community. And what I'm seeing is, uh, I don't know what I'm seeing in terms of the, the final net results. If we, if we did a survey today, I don't think there'd be 
75 percent of the people that that favor train it might be the other way around so honoring i guess the commitment for for, for the unified corridor study is a is a starting point um, a commitment that we uh, approach these negotiations in, because we're going to we're going to hand over that commit that responsibility to the executive director i want the best deal for our community and what that represents and um, you know, I'm just hoping that, you know, I guess I want a little bit more uh, just the bullet points to your me measure that guarantees that any commitment, any sort of agreement that happens with Progressive does not get in front of the will of the people. That's the most important thing. And if you give a 10 or 20 year or even talk about that, how, 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 can, how can we reasonably talk about a 10 or 20 year possibility when we know that flies in the face of what this community wants, they don't. They, they want. They want options first. They want. They want uh, information. And to, and I thought it was kind of irresponsible to even suggest a 10 or 20 year deal um, when people here just don't want it. So um, I guess I need a little bit more information. I, I appreciate the uh, the. Uh, <laughs> Please, uh, you know, I want to honor the, the time commitment that we have, but, uh, you know, I just want to make sure that we're not obligating ourselves um, to something that the community doesn't want, a, a time commitment, and also uh, negotiations in good faith that look after the interests of this commission and this community. Let me just say a few things in response to that, because I think um, the community wants a lot of different things. And as we heard today, there are different, uh, very strong differences of opinion about the what the community wants. The second thing I would say is that the staff works for the commission. If a majority of the commission is unhappy with the staff or thinks they're biased or thinks that they don't represent the community sufficiently, we should get rid of the staff. And if we don't get rid of the staff, then I think we need to be supportive of the staff because they are representing what the commission does. Finally, I think it's important to remember that it's the commission that's going to vote on any agreement. It's not the staff that's going to make an agreement. The staff is going to be bring back and it will have to deal with issues about timeline. It will have to deal with issues about commitment that the uh, financial commitments that the, the operator will, will do. It will deal with uh, the whole range of issues. And the commission will decide whether it likes it or not. And if it doesn't like it, it will direct staff to go back and do something else. To think that this is really a staff-driven process is a mistake, uh, in my view. The staff is representing what the commission has decided all along the way, and I, you know, I, I feel that as long as they continue to do so, and that still represents the majority of the commission, then we should continue to support the staff. May I? Let's just let's just, let's just keep the, the the back and forth. It is 12:30, um, and there's a number of other people who want to speak. So I I, I don't want to get in. I just don't want to get into this uh, battle between commissioners. I, I, I would like to hear from all the commissioners first. Well, I, well I, I, what I'm going to say is I well, think you uh, cut well, him off. Uh, he I'm, I'm, I'm trying yeah, to keep us focused on, now on, you are on, after on the he question. Spoke, though. I'm Let, trying to give everybody a chance to speak, all Supervisor right. Caput. And next up would be Commissioner Bertrand. Thank you, Chairperson. <laughs> so. As exemplified by Capitola's vote last Thursday, we feel that the Unified Quarter Study is a promise to the people of Santa Cruz to come up with what is termed the best proposal to meet our transportation needs. And I don't know what that is. I'm not a data geek. I'm not a transportation person. I have a totally different background. So we've hired a company to do that. And I want to stick with that. I also share with Supervisor Bruce McPherson's concern, and I have the same concern, that we're asked to make a decision today, and we haven't been adequately apprised in a public arena of the legal issues that are before us in terms of providing a rail corridor that's functional. But we also know our, royal, our rail corridor is not functional. <laughs> You can't move anything right now except down in Watsonville. 
which is one reason why I asked Progressive, would you be satisfied if you had that chunk carved out for you? Would that be a viable business operation? And the answer is yes. Well, that tells me a lot. Maybe that's the jewel in the crown. I don't know. That needs to be worked out. So I'm going to vote against this. I feel strongly that we need to wait for the unified quarter study. We need to come up with a proposal that's based solidly. I'm going to vote against it because I want to wait a month. I want to see from a legal standing where we are right now. I don't think Mr. Schifrin's proposal is a bad one. I don't think we should make that vote right now because we need as responsible uh, representatives of our community to know where we stand legally. Those are my comments. Uh, Commissioner Rios. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank everybody that came and, and uh, gave us their perspective. Uh, yes, this is, uh, this is very hard, and I'm glad to finally hear that Watsonville is a jewel. Wow, right on. You know? Um, we are, because we are a jewel. I mean, that's, that's already. But I think that a lot of the discussion that has been going on, that we've been going through this for since the 90s, for come to here, to this point, we're here because of everything that we've done in the 90s, all the different studies, and a lot of, a lot of money that has gone into it. But it's still the question is, how are we going to resolve the gridlock that is on Highway 1 every day? We can talk about it, we can talk about it, we can get doing you know, studies, that gridlock is there, and it's going to continue. And I don't know, you know, I mean, it's nice, the trail, and uh, I, I think it's nice. I don't know how many workers will be getting off at midnight taking a bicycle back to, to Watsonville. It will be very hard. Maybe electrical bike, perhaps, but it's going to be a different experience. I don't know if that's the solution to the gridlock on Highway 1. We have a gridlock on Highway 1. What are we going to do about it? Today's presentation, I came with open mind. I stayed last night late reading as much as I could. And I came with an open mind. I like what I heard. I, I also have the questions that have been raised here. I don't fully understand all of them, but I think there's a lot of concerns. But I also feel that, yes, there are opinions and there are active groups, and there are things that people don't like. I don't like what Trump is doing. I don't like it. A lot of us don't like it. A lot of people do like it. We have differences. So again, I feel that right now we have to, I, I support the motion, and I would support it. I think that we have to continue with the study. We have to come back. There's a lot of legal questions that we need to go. But I also feel that we need to respect each other's view. Let's not, let's not get into what is going on in the country today and putting all these anti-things and anti-that and blaming people. So let's not blame our staff here. I agree that this, we are the ones that are gonna make decisions. But I also feel very strongly that unless we deal with the question of how we're gonna relieve the gridlock on Highway 1 for all those commuters that every day go morning and night, because a lot of our friends and a lot of our workers have to do that every day. They are just looking. How, you know, who is gonna, who's going to help this? Who's gonna, who is going to help us relieve this mess? So that's why I, I'm very supportive of looking for alternatives. And I, wanna, I want a progressive to also deal with that question, with the question of how you're going to help relieve the gridlock on Highway 1. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Chair. Uh, Commissioner Brown. So I actually don't think there's anything more to add. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody who has participated in this discussion today. And it's not, it's not the end of the conversation. We're going to be continuing to have the conversation. And I want to thank our staff for doing a really, really great job of trying to help us muddle through a conundrum that we face here today. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for being here, and I'm prepared to vote when Thank you. support. Uh, Thank you. Uh, for the question? Or well, I'll, I'll, uh, 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 give me a chance. <laughs> so uh, I'll, be, I'll try to be brief. 
Um, I want to. I appreciate the passion in which this uh, this brings out in people. Uh, uh, people are passionate about transportation in Santa Cruz County. Uh, the, the big fight used to be over the highway. We seem to have moved a little over, and now it's over the corridor. Um, uh, but people are impassioned about it, and they were passionate about it when um, when we bought it. Hundreds of people came out. This commission unanimously decided uh, to purchase the, the rail line. We should have understood at that time what we were committing to, um, and uh, we committed to running freight service on there. Um, and we have to figure out a way to honor that commitment. Um, and I appreciate that there's a portion of the motion that says we may need to come back and, and talk about that because that's a, that's a real issue. Um, the testimony that we heard today uh, covered the gamut. Uh, and, uh, you know, there were people who said, you know, uh, uh, let's wait for the unified corridor study to be done. There were people who said the unified corridor study is rigged. There were people who said use science. There were people who said uh, the decisions made on Measure D were made because what was on the poster. So we, we covered a lot, of, a lot of different pieces. This is a, the, the proposal before us is realistic in the sense that uh, it's taking a look of uh, experienced uh, operators. And uh, I think we should start negotiation. You now have a, a real clear idea of what the community um, discussion is, and that will uh, uh, you'll, you'll see that in the in the, the context of negotiation uh, about that. Sounds like you have some experience in uh, in dealing with that, and um, that might be useful to us uh, uh, as as part of this. Um, I think that uh, that if we say that we want to wait for the unified corridor study to be done, we have to listen to what the unified corridor study says. And the staff has made a very realistic effort. We have, uh, there, there is input, not only from stakeholder meetings, public meetings, uh, additional reports that have been uh, created by reputable consultants that will all feed into this. But I don't wanna be at the place where people say, let's wait for the Unified Quarter Study and let's, let's throw it out because we don't like some part of it. We, if, that's, if that's gonna be our measure, you know, we should real, realistically look at it, but you can't throw the, the baby out with the bathwater if that's what you say we should wait on making this decision. So um, I'm gonna support the, the motion. I, I, I think we could uh, probably move this um, through uh, more quickly and we could have some reasonable out uh, clauses with, uh, uh, with uh, the agreement, uh, but it seems as though there's a, a majority of the commission that wants to wait. Uh, until the unified quarter study is done and with the exceptions that may come. Um, and so with that, I will call the question. John, like, can I? Those, I just to Those are different items, Ms. McNulty. We will, we, no, they're. Thank you, I'm sorry, just yeah. to John, I want to add one, one sentence literally. Okay. People keep saying that we have this legal obligation to provide freight service. Let me remind you, we have a $20 million legal obligation to provide passenger service. And that's what got us into what some people think is ridiculous passenger service or not that helpful. But that's why we ended up getting into that stuff because we have to provide some passenger service as well. Yeah. So um, uh, the, the discussion has been made. So uh, I'm gonna call the question. All in favor of the motion made by uh, Commissioner Schifrin, say aye. Read, aye. read the motion. The motion is select Progressive Rail as the preferred entity potentially to operate rail service on the Santa Cruz branch line for purposes of, of negotiating a draft operating agreement. Direct staff to return uh, to the commission if legally required uh, interim actions are necessary. And finally, authorize the executive director to negotiate a draft agreement with Progressive Rail and return to the RTC for consideration of the negotiated agreement with the understanding that the RTC will consider final adoption of the agreement after the unified corridor study is completed and acted upon. Uh, all, we're all clear on what the motion is. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, McPherson, Johnson, and Bertrand are noes.
Um, so with that, we have a couple more items here. I, I appreciate the indulgence of our of everyone. We have item 20 20A, which was item 10, which is approved storm damage repairs. There's a civil engineering services resolution. Um, Ms. McNulty, you uh, you pulled this off. If you could make brief comments, that would. Thank you. Um, I would ask everybody that the meeting is still continuing. If you could take your conversations still going on, outside, guys, we have some consent items. Mm -hmm. um, please, please, if you're going to have conversations, go outside. Ms. McNulty. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm sorry, I didn't understand the order on that, but I just wanted to make sure that we are addressing the idea that. I'll, while we're talking about entering these negotiations, a piece of that process is spending 3.2, I, I believe that's the math that Progressive has started as a beginning point um, that the RTC would need to invest to get the currently out of surface, out of service tracks up to date in order to start running any sort of rail. So, and we had on the consent agenda, I believe an item to start entering, looking at civil engineering estimates on those. I, I think we need to be prudent here we have Measure D, we're still trying to figure out how to buy buses, we're still trying to figure out how to fill potholes. Let's not put any engineering time into stuff that we're not necessarily going to do. I understand that Commissioner Friend needs to protect his constituents and other people probably do too. You know, places where the um, problems from weather related conditions are infringing on homeowners and that type of thing, surely we need to address those. <laughs> we should not be spending engineering money on looking at getting the tracks into serviceable condition when we have not yet decided that that's the um, direction that our community is going. Let's not waste our money. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address us on this item? And I'll bring it back to the commission for action. I would move the staff, uh, the staff recommendation with the, um, I make the point that if the commission doesn't move forward to um, <laughs> fix uh, storm damage, it will lose its FEMA money. Um, and this is the way that the federal government is gonna pay for the vast majority of the cost of repairing the damage. We need to move forward with it um, and the way to do that so that they will ultimately agree that the work that's needed they will pay for is to hire an engineering firm to do the, to do the analysis. So on Second. that basis, I move the staff recommendation. There's a motion by Schiffer and seconded by Rockin. Commissioner Johnson. What is the math on that? I mean, how much is it going to cost? How much is it going to uh, provide? Does she have to be an engineer? Yeah, you, you have to sort of, you, you figure out the project, they review it, and they tell you what, what's going on. So with, this is the initial right. phase. Right. 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 Other comments? Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next, we'll move on to 13B, which is a December 5th letter from our very own Santa Cruz County Supervisor, Zach Friend, requesting that the rail line maintenance plan be in the January 18th, 2018 RTC agenda. Um, Ms. McNulty, you pulled this item off. Okay. Well, then I, I did have one question of clarification uh, from the Executive Director. Thank you for your presentation during your report. Uh, you didn't provide an interim solution. So the wettest months in this county are traditionally the next three that we're in, this one, February and March. Um, you're in the process of uh, coming back in March with uh, a plan, but if um, the same things happen in my district that happened in January of last year, I don't know what the solution would be, and that wasn't mentioned. And so, because uh, oh. we're 12, first off, we're 12 months into the damage that already occurred, but I think that we could potentially have damage in January, February, or March of the coming year, and, and it just, I, I wanted to know where the interim solution would be, what the remedy would be for people that have those concerns. So, um, valid question. Um, I, I'd like Sarah uh, to, to tell you a little bit more about some of the work she's been doing, because um, we, it wasn't quite ready to bring to you today, and we knew we were going to have a long meeting anyway. So, uh, and I don't think it's going to be quite ready in two weeks for the February meeting. That's why I said March. But that's not to say we're not doing anything. I think we're much more set up to deal with things as they come in, and I'll let Sarah talk about that a little bit. Sure. So, hi, I'm Sarah Christensen, a senior transportation engineer. Um, we have been working very hard on um, on a number of things on the rail line. First and foremost, our highest priority is getting the rail line um, back up and running. 
Uh, so initiating the storm damage repair projects, getting those going. Um, the other um, things that are on our list are basically to establish a preventative maintenance program. Um, this basically will address the four main issues that we see, one being um, drainage is probably the most important one, um, vegetation control, graffiti, and um, basically trash and encampment cleanup along the rail line. So we are in the process of developing standard operating procedures um, to address all of those ongoing concerns on the rail line. Um, and <coughs> the final uh, procedures are going to depend heavily on uh, what agreement we come up with with the progressive rail. We are only responsible for maintaining what's outside the rail uh, envelope. And so uh, depending on the nitty gritty details of that agreement, we will draft the procedures for the maintenance program around that. Um, and in the interim, we are um, tackling issues as they come up on a case by case basis by um, there are relatively small improvements being made, but um, getting bids from contractors and getting work done um, out there. So we have a couple of those that are in the works. We're on the schedule for two small um, improvement projects that are in your district. So, other questions? It, it provi what it what it means. I mean, this is how. I, thanks, Ms. Christensen, for that presentation. What I what I hear though is is that um, we don't have a plan fully yet. And if, if somebody were to have a tree fall on their house, or the, they were to continue to get flooded, it would just be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. We don't have a formal process for it. I mean, I just want us to recognize how difficult that actually is, right, for the community and how <laughs> this has been a, an issue for some time in a lot of regards regarding the, the commission in responsiveness to these issues. But I appreciate that we're creating a process. It's unfortunate it took this long. I mean, I, I think it's uh, pretty inexcusable. Anybody who drives down Highway 1, as Director Rios does, uh, can see a damaged rail crossing fence that's been sitting there for 11 months and uh, with commitments for it to get fixed twice and nothing's been addressed and like how that works then optically in the co in the faith in the commission and we don't when they contact me and we don't really have a process for it but I'm more concerned about the immediate needs that if somebody reaches out and says hey my house is getting flooded because of rail line drainage issues that it doesn't end up in a black hole that it gets addressed immediately that there should be an emergency plan for contractors there should be an ability to get addressed that same day or within you know, 24, 48 hours, and I'm not hearing that that's going to be the case yet, and I don't want to wait until we find out uh, what the agreement is with Progressive, because it could be 12 months until we have a, you know, a final agreement with them as well. So I'm concerned. I, I, I want to say I'm concerned. I don't feel that the remedy is quite there. I'm going to be open to what you provide back in March, but of course, at that point, we'll most likely be through the damage of the season anyway, and in my concern is between January and March, the past Damage already being done that's not being addressed is part one, but the, uh, the damage that could occur in the next three months is my concern. And so I just want to make sure um, that something is done for these people, if what, whatever happens in the next couple of months. It's not, this isn't an, an action item. This was just a letter I sent all of you a month ago that you just saw the last week. So, um, you know, and I spoke to the executive director and learned that he'd be responding to it uh, orally, uh, although I know I just got a letter from you today, actually, in, in writing yeah, today. Okay. Are there any other questions that people have? Um, I don't think it do require any action. Well, uh, we uh, no, I think it does. It was on the consent agenda. Yeah, I would just move right. we that accept. we accept the staff second recommendation. Uh, motion by Schiffer and seconded by Rockin. All in favor. Is there anyone else from the public who'd like to address us? Uh, seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. We put the oral, uh, uh, oral communications at the end of the meeting. And this could be a time that you could address the uh, RTC about issues under the purview of the RTC. You'll have one minute uh, to address us. Um, Think about the rail trail. Uh, yeah, d we don't want to rehash something that was already on our agenda. So uh, <coughs> you don't have to come forward, but I'm legally required to ask you if you want. All right. Hi, Peter Stanger here. Um, I did send in pictures to all of you about the uh, bike lane along San Andreas Road. Um, there's so much encroachment on the roadway um, that I needed to provide you with these pictures. There's sand, there's the bushes on it. 
Um, and now the Public Works is uh, in an effort to uh, mitigate the erosion, uh, has even put um, asphalt out there. Question gets, and I really beg you to give me an answer, how small is, can the bike lane get in width before it needs to be addressed? Because in some spots, we're down to less than a foot wide. And there's all these people coming along uh, to KOA and the other places with these huge RVs. You don't have room. Please, what is the minimum width before you're going to address the bike lane? Um, is there anyone else who would like to address us on oral communication? Ms. McNulty. Thank you. Um, two last things. One, I just wanted to um, recognize the new detour that we have with um, segment phase seven, segment seven, phase one on the west side. Uh, you've probably all heard by now that the city of Santa Cruz has needed to do a reroute because New Leaf has decided that it would be too detrimental to their customers to have their whole back row of parking removed. So there is now a new detour with segment seven phase one which takes swift street to ingles to fair and it's just a, another glaring indication that the current mbsst is destined to fail and to be a fragmented path that will not in any way shape or form either um, improve our community's bike safety make it safer for children to bike to and from school or anything like that um, and then i also wanted to just take a moment to mentioned that someone mentioned the encampments and the cleanups that are part of this fixing up the rail corridor. Keep that in mind. I mean, that's a piece of this picture. So thank you. Um, thank thank you. you. Activating the corridor. And sorry to hear that the New Leaf is reneging on their uh, past agreement. Uh, anyone else would like to address us? All right, almost lunchtime. Manu Koenig, I just wanted to plant a seed here, which is, you know, we all ask the question, how can we even consider trail only when we have all this traffic congestion on Highway 1? <laughs> And I think there's one more uh, solution that really needs to be considered in the UCIS, and that is congestion tolls. Um, it's in line with what the state's looking at as far as with the road charge program. It's essentially a software solution, something that allows us to control the behavior of people uh, who choose and how they use uh, to get around this county using tax. So it's a double-edged sword. Uh, and it would also provide revenue that we clearly so desperately need um, as the 2040 uh, RTP outline. So <laughs> please, uh, you know, I haven't studied this as, as much as I'd like to. Um, I'll certainly look into it more and draft a letter and send it to you. Um, but of course, that's what the UCIS is for. That's what we're paying the consultants for. So why don't we look at this? It's a great alternative. Thanks. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else who'd like to address us in closed session? I mean, uh, for uh, oral communication. <laughs> we'll get to that one next. Uh, in relation to the uh, detour on segment seven, I, I attended the meetings of both the Capitol and Scotts Valley City Councils in the last week where the UCIS was brought up as the reason to not take a position on the rationality of leaving the trails in place. A number of politicians on both councils said that the only responsible thing to do is wait for the results. On segment seven, you voted to uh, proceed in advance of the UCIS. I think in light of the deterioration of the utility of segment seven, I'd like to ask the commission to reconsider pushing forward with that construction until the UCIS is in. Thank you. Thank you. And just for clarification, uh, we received a grant for engineering. We won't even get the money for at least another year. So uh, we have not started work on segment seven uh, as, yet, as of yet. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to address us during oral <coughs> communication? Sorry, I'm sorry, that was just the oh. Yeah. Oh, right. Sorry. sorry. Yeah, I, I apologize. I was talking about segment nine. I was from Live Oak, so I figured he was talking about Live Oak. Yeah. That's about the new detour. So, yeah, the city is the lead on that project. Yeah. I apologize. I gave out bad information there. One more. Okay. I can still take it. I'm still oral. This uh, order kind of got me, or out of order kind of got me there. So some of my talking points might be a little shuffled here. But I did, uh, my main thing that I wanted to mention here is that um, I am really impressed with some of the progress made in the public transportation forefront with the Santa Cruz Metro. I'd recently taken a ride on one of their articulated buses late at night and was amazed at their feature of additional capacity, security cameras, all of which are overdue. 
but we're long overdue. And I get that that's a UCSC pilot program, but um, seeing that those buses in the community really shows a countywide commitment towards improving transportation. And I hope to see them continue the use beyond the six month pilot program. Maybe we could use Measure D funds for that. Also, uh, there's an intersection on Ocean Street, uh, northbound, uh, where it intersects with SoCal, the lanes curve, and there's no reflectors. It'd be great if we could get those because I see people veer into the uh, right lane from the left without even thinking about Thank it. Thank you. All right, I'm going to give one last call on, uh, on oral communication. Seeing none, 